What kind of hold does that man have on you? So you expect me to keep your secret? I keep yours. You're threatening me? We've all got secrets, Watts. No one likes having them exposed. Should anyone know of any reason that this couple should not be joined in holy matrimony? Speak now or forever hold your peace. You? George, what do you want to do? How long are we expected to stay here? Effie's gone home. I suppose it's safe now for you to leave as well. You don't have anything you want to say about any of this? I'm sorry. Hollow words. She loved you, you know. And she is my dearest friend. I'm sorry is hardly enough. Right then, Crabtree, let's get out of here. I had no choice. I had no choice. You left that poor woman standing at the altar. I thought you were a better man than that, Crabtree. Is there something you would like to tell us, George? Anything at all? Oh. George? We didn't mean it to be so dramatic. Oleander and I tried to get here earlier. Why are you apologizing? We just saved that young woman's life. And destroyed mine. If you had married her, she would have died. It was foretold. I know. Don't be disturbing that girl. He's taken to the morgue, Henry. Of course, sir. Although Mrs. Hart is away until tomorrow morning. Are you suggesting we wait? Well, of course not. Uh, what do you think happened here, sir? I have no idea. Someone may be playing a hoax on us. The hoax? Yes. They've staged a scene so to make it appear that the dead man committed this crime. Let's proceed as though no one has risen from the dead for now, Henry. Very good, sir. Thankfully, both men were without family. I spoke to one of the other groundskeepers, sir. Uh, one of the dead men, Lowell Vaz, worked here for six years. The other, Ronan Trent, took his dog for his daily walk here every day. Oh. Any sign of the dog? No, sir. Uh, Three-legged. Only creature, I'm told. Very good, Henry. Sir, if I may? Of course. What do you think about what George did? I think George left the woman he loves at the altar. Yes, and? 
all of the years that I've been doing this, Henry, I still don't know the inner workings of man's mind, much less George Crabtree's. I think he got cold feet, staged the whole thing so he wouldn't have to marry. Where might we find this groundskeeper? Uh, this way, sir. I can't apologize for speaking the truth to spare a life. Are you sure this was her fate? If Miss Newsom were to marry you, yes. Why? I do not know the answer to that. I only know what is to be. Your aunt has never been wrong, George. You know that. But why not tell me earlier, when we came for a visit? The vision had yet to come to me. Be thankful it came to me when it did. If it had not come, your bride would be a dead woman. And your heart would be broken. My heart is broken. Then go away from here and let it heal. Oh, you always were a sensitive cabbage, George. But I know you have a spine of steel. You will persevere. It's not even consecrated land. Shouldn't have been anyone buried over there. Well, it seems there was. Still, no record of it. Do you have a list of the recent arrivals to this place? That I do. And you can provide it? Of course. But where those two men were found, it wasn't no plot. I see. Well, it seems to have served the same purpose. You know what I think? There was a hole the devil got out of. I don't think Mr. Frank Lloyd Wright would approve of what we've done with his home. It's our home. I don't know if he'd see it that way. What's caught your attention? It's a list of recent arrivals to Pauper's Field. Why is that? Well, if I'm to believe the evidence before me, one of them has risen from the dead and killed two men. I take it you don't believe that. I'm not George Crabtree, Julia. Have you spoken with him? A little. And why did he walk out on his wedding? Apparently, one of his aunts warned him that if he were to marry, his bride would be doomed to die. I hope you talk sense to him. It's George, Julia. Sometimes common sense doesn't work. What are we doing with that? Um, Dr. Grace's gift. It's hideous. It is that. Not to mention impractical. Also that. Can we burn it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, if anybody has anything to say, say it now. Um, <clears throat> where's Watts? He left. Left for where? He didn't say, and no one saw him go. What are you doing? I'm assisting the detective with a murder investigation. The killer came from beyond the grave. It's right up your alley. will do fine. George! Oh, for Pete's sake. What are you doing here? I was rather blunt earlier. I came to apologize, not for my prediction, but for my manner. Are you here on police business? I'm here to see my nephew. Well, see him on your own time. We're working here. Sir. I'm asking her to leave. Do you have an issue with that, Crabtree? Don't worry, George. I'm leaving. You need to get your house in order. Sir, she's just trying to protect me. I don't understand you, Crabtree. You've been working for the last 15 years with the most logical, intelligent man I've ever known. Yet you still believe all this mumbo-jumbo claptrap that you get fed. Sir, my aunt has never been wrong. Oh. 
It's all right, George. I understand. You do? Yes, you're a lucky man. Lucky? How so? You never actually wanted to marry Miss Newsom, but you were too afraid to ever say that. So when your aunt walked in, you had the perfect excuse. Almost as if you planned it. Higgins, watch what you're saying. George, it's all right. There's I'm no serious. Shut your mouth. Shut up. Get in the patio. Crap tree, get out of here. Sir, he's trying to insinuate. I don't give a toss what Higgins is trying to say. Go home. Not a word. Inspector Thomas Brackenry. Who are you? What do you want? Raymond Felding, private investigator. A moment of your time. I'm busy. Uh, it's a matter concerns the both of us. It's about a man named Llewellyn Watts. Follow me. This is about Watts? Yeah, I'm looking for him. You and me both. I see. What's your business with him? Ah, it's a personal matter. Whether Watts is here or not, he's still in the employ of the Toronto Constabulary. So I'll ask you again. What's your business with him? I'm hoping you can help me locate him, Mr. Jack Walker. How can Watts help you with this? I believe they are of a close acquaintance. I don't know anything about that. I see. And what do you want with Mr. Walker? Well, he's abducted a child. I'm trying to return this child to his maternal grandparents. I don't know anything about that either. This child is being raised in an obscene environment by an immoral man. It's your duty. Mr. Feldin, you don't tell me what my duty is. You know, I've been given a substantial sum to locate this child. I'm not shy about offering a share if someone can help me. If you're finished attempting to bribe a police officer, I suggest you take your leave, Mr. Feldin. Otherwise, I'll have you escorted out. Good day. Sir? What have you, Henry? I've contacted the records office. They're assembling files on all recent hospital deaths. Very good. Thank you. Julia! Is everything all right? Yes, everything's perfectly fine. Perhaps too much so. Ah, <laughs> uh, look who's here. Is she reading and writing yet? <laughs> Actually, William has her working on her maths right now. That's a joke, right? I wish it were. It's important. William, I'm thinking of returning to the clinic. Uh, Julia. But not every day, but Ellie is taking such excellent care of Susanna. And... Yes, well, for what we're paying her. I... Did I hear the clinic mentioned? Could Margaret join you? I know she valued the time there. Oh, yes, of course. If you think it's best. And where are you off to? Ah, the hospital records office. <laughs> so I'm looking into the circumstances behind all of their latest deaths. Your husband is looking for a member of the Walking Dead. Oh, perhaps he should start at the Mason's Lodge. <laughs> Do you mind if I join you? It would be nice to have a moment alone. Of course. Uh, sir, any news on Watts' whereabouts? Yet? Not as of yet. Do you have any idea if he plans to return? I don't know. He appears to have vanished into thin air. Carry on. Excellent. These are much better than the ones in Canada. Hey, of course they are. This is New York City. Everything's better here. Mm. Would you like some? Hello. How you doing, buddy? <gasps> all finished for the day? Yes, indeed. I'm all yours. Good Lord. How many of those are you going to eat in a day? Uh, I don't count. I simply consume. Oh, I see him at least three times. Oh, we'll have to put a stop to that. No, 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 no. Please don't. Please don't. <laughs> So, have you given any thought as to what you're going to do now that you're here? Have you ever heard the term franchise? I have. Well, I've been talking to Abraham. Perhaps I'll get into the bagel business. Yes? Yes. <laughs> Not serious. Right now, I'm simply happy being here. All right. So there's no living person who wished either of the victims ill? None that I can find. Are you sure? 
You said there was no record of anyone being interred there. Perhaps the disturbed grave was a hoax? So it's your theory that a live person staged this murder and then assigned the blame to a Haitian zombie? Who would believe that? I can think of one constable at your station that might. Still, I don't think it's likely. You need to talk to him, William. Well, he still has a chance with Effie. If George wants to discuss it with me, he will. Well, you need to press him on it. Julia, I am just not comfortable with those sorts of conversations. Well, you need to get comfortable. You have a daughter now. Things are not pleasant or easy to talk about are going to need to be discussed at some point. I know. That's why I have you. <laughs> well, all of the deaths from St. Michael's are accounted for. I do hope Susanna has the sense to not follow us in our footsteps. What would you have her do instead? Something exciting. Politician, perhaps? Or an aviator? I just want her to live her life not surrounded by death. And you should talk to George. <sighs> Well, I read in Women's Monthly that when you suffer heartbreak, you should wear bright colors. That's exciting. So we should go shopping. Effie, I have to talk to you. Well, she doesn't want to talk to you. Well, I'm not talking to you. I have nothing to say to you, George. Well, I have something to say to you. I had to do what I did. Well, you did it. So good for you. I did it to save your life. Look, George, grow up. My Aunt Oleander told me that if I marry you, you would die. I, I heard the same thing you did, and it's poppycock. It's ridiculous. It's not. If you didn't want to marry her, you could have just said so. Millie, this is none of your business. It is. She's my friend. I love her. You love me? You love me, really? Is that why you humiliated me in front of my friends and my family? I'm sorry. That's not good enough, George. Just leave me alone, would you? Just go back to your spooks and your spirits. I am too good to be with a simpleton. Effie. Just leave me. Would you? If you had any decency, you would just leave me alone. Oh. Effie. <laughs> Miss Cherry. Detective Murdoch. Is there something I can help you with? How is George faring? That's hardly a matter for public consumption. I wasn't going to write about it. I'm simply concerned. Oh, my apologies. But there is another matter I'm concerned about. Of course there is. What can you tell me about the zombie killer? Nothing. There have been reports that a hideous creature has risen from the grave and is attacking Toronto. Can I say... That's ridiculous. I've been robbed. Excuse me a moment, Miss Cherry. What's happened? A man broke into my shop. I was there. Did he hurt you? Just scared the daylights out of me. He stole two guns, some ammunition. And when did this happen? Only an hour ago. Well, can you describe him? He was a big fella. Anything else? He was covered in dirt and soil. I beg your pardon? You didn't hear me? He was covered in earth, dirt, and he had a dog crazy looking thing with three legs the constable will take the remainder of your statement the three-legged dog is a nice twist George? 
I join you? George, what I said was inappropriate. It was incorrect. All right. It's incorrect as well. My Aunt Oleander's never wrong about these things, Henry. I can't explain. She, she has some sort of gift, even as a child. I remember once she begged my uncle not to go out to sea. This is back in Newfoundland. And he didn't listen to her, and he never returned. He drowned in the Atlantic Ocean, George. It's hardly unusual. Yes, but that's one of many things that, that she foretold and it came true. I can't expect you to understand, Higgins, but I can't risk Effie's life. Constables, I wonder if you can help. Uh, currently off the clock, ma'am. Sorry. Higgins, what is it, Miss Bright? Someone broke into my establishment last night, stole three bottles of whiskey. Did you report it? Certainly did. I told the officer on patrol. He did nothing. Well, unfortunately, with that kind of thing, unless we catch somebody in the act, there's little we can do. Hardly a surprise. Sorry, I can't be more help. Yes, well, if all I heard is true, well, after the last couple of days, you deserve to have a free drink. On the house. Not for you, though. Good Lord, does the whole world know? George, I just want you to think about this. You and Effie visited your aunts, did you not? We did. And they said nothing about this while you were visiting them? No, but they didn't know we were to be married. My aunt Chrysanthemum found out only days before. So, armed with this information, they rushed into Toronto to break up the wedding? That doesn't seem suspicious to you? I think they were trying to save Effie's life. Perhaps, but what if there was another motive? It's not as though your aunts have followed the straight and narrow path. George wants to speak to me. He has questions? I suppose. Hmm. Then we must give him no reason to doubt the accuracy of your predictions. Thanks for coming to see me. Again, I apologize for the news I had to deliver. Can I ask why you came all the way here to do so? I wanted to tell you in person. I did not think a telegram would suffice. How did you even know I was to be married? Chrysanthemum told me. And once I heard, I knew I had to stop it. Uh. So my upcoming marriage didn't uh, come to you in a vision? No, it did not come to me in a vision, George. And you know better than to mock me. Well, maybe I wouldn't if you hadn't stolen my happiness. Something that is not my intention. See that man there? In the gray hat? Yes, why? Something ill is about to befall him. Good Lord. Well, he's not dead. I didn't say he was going to die, George. I merely said something ill is about to befall him, and it did. It is a heavy burden that I bear, and it pains me to break your heart. But my little cabbage, I owe you the truth and a chance for happiness and not misery. The streets are a menace, George. Ruthie nearly gets struck by a vehicle every second week. Higgins, I'm telling you, my aunt said something would befall this chap, and he was struck a moment later. Like I said, George, it's a coincidence. You're wrong, Henry. I'm living under a cloud of doom. George, how are you faring? I've been better, sir. Well, I just happen to be working on a case that might interest you. Sir, with your permission, I'm sure you and Henry can handle it. George. You've made one mistake. There could still be time to... If you don't to... mind, sir, I have a patrol to get to. All right. Get I'm certainly glad you're here. Thank you. Says I'm having to pay someone to look in on him. Ah, oh, very funny. I shall see you when I... Return. Well, Samuel, what do we do today? And nothing else was stolen? Just three bottles of good whiskey. We should get some new locks for the door. You do work with the police. Perhaps they could come round more often. That may do more harm than good. I think we can tend to ourselves, Miss Bright. 
The books all appear to be in order, except for this. Uh, yes. That is our tribute to Alderman Prescott. We're paying him now? Keeps the doors open. I did tell you, didn't I? Did tell me what? That given the chance, I'd make something of this place. It's a good thing your father didn't get a hold of it. It's a good thing my father died. That is not what I intended to say, Violet. That's all right, Miss Bright. I share a similar sentiment. Good night. <laughs> Jack! Uh, Jack's out. Can I help you? Did you see anyone near my flat? No. Are you sure? You didn't hear anything out of the ordinary. I did not. Why? Look. Uh, one moment. I've been robbed. I can see that. What am I supposed to do? Everything that I own is in this room. Let me take a look. I have some experience in these matters. Let's go see what we can do. They took my father's coins. Were they hidden? Yes. So the thief knew of them? I suppose. So it would follow you know the thief or the thief knows you? I don't know who it is. I understand that, but it does give us a list of suspects. Who of the people you know would know that this coin collection was valuable? I suppose everyone. I did crow about it a bit. Mm. Trevor, what happened to her? You all right? Does it look like it? Have the police been informed? No. Well, we should... No. We don't bother the police, and they don't bother us. That is the way it works here. He's right, Llewellyn. I see. So we solve it ourselves? What's this, then? It's a list of the deceased in Toronto over the past two weeks. You're missing one. I am? Morris Majors. Violet Hart's father. Watts thinks I killed him. That's part of the reason why he left. Did you? Don't be a prat, Higgins. You should come back to Wexford. Roderick still does carry a torch. And I hope he lights himself on fire with it. <laughs> My life is here, Mary. There! It's that witch who destroyed her really? life. You know, you should be ashamed of yourself showing your face in public. You're the maid. The maid of honor. At a wedding, you destroyed. Oh. I know your heart is filled with grief. It's more like anger. I was only trying to save the two of you. Well, I think you're crazy and wrong. And George, you've filled his head with... With the truth. Ah, this is ridiculous. Really? This is George Crabtree's fault. It's no one's fault. No one except the stars and destiny. Torn oh, down oh, oh, Let me curse. Torn down, please. Why don't you curse me? Please, that's please. enough. Stop. What's going on here? Oh, well, it's all right. Uh, George, we were... We were just having a conversation. We were just on our way as well. Hmm. <sighs> Detective, <clears throat> I was just about to leave. How can I help you? I understand your father passed away recently. My condolences. Thank you. If I may, what killed him? He had a brain embolism. Very unexpected. Mm -hmm. Where was he buried? Why do you want to know that? Just paying proper attention to a case I'm on. His body was shipped to New York. I knew him well enough to know that's where he wanted his resting place to be. Could you provide me with the location of his final destination? Of course. Are you good? Thank you. If that is all? It is. For now. Well, I'm going to head to the Starbright Club. There's been a robbery there last night, and the police have done very little about it. The burden of running a black business, I imagine.
New York City. That's what she said. I've spoken with the railway, and they confirmed they delivered a coffin to that address. Well, I feel the trip is in order. If only to eliminate him as a suspect. Well, sir, a telephone call would do the same. I believe Watts is there. I need to talk to him. I threatened to reveal his secret. Sir? It was rash, I was angry, and I need to make it right. And there's more. A private detective is looking for Jack Walker. He wants to take his child away from him. I feel I need to warn them. Promise. Right. Thank you, Julia. Oh, for what? Oh, a most fulfilling day. You're most welcome. <laughs> Margaret, now that your children have grown... Oh, well, one in jail, the other one an itinerant actor, are you sure you'd like me to look after your child? Oh, th that's not what I was suggesting. Oh, I see. I, I was thinking of starting a nurse in training program, and you'd be an excellent candidate. Me? Why not you? <laughs> Margaret Nightingale. <laughs> if you wish. <laughs> Margaret, are you all right? I just need to lay down. <laughs> Margaret, get a bed ready. Who did this to you? Please, I, I just need to lie down. <laughs> Come. Anybody there? A cat is not the only thing with nine lives. There's your mother now. <sighs> How was your first day back at the clinic? Oh, trying, but it's good to be back. Mm. <sighs> you seem troubled. The woman came into the clinic just as we were closing, badly bruised. She said she'd fallen down a flight of stairs. Ah, I take it that wasn't the case. I've seen enough bruising in my life to know that she was lying. She was assaulted. Oh. Would you like me to speak with her? Oh, I'll speak with her. See if I can get her to come through. Oh. Anyway, don't you have a zombie to catch? Oh, yes. Oh, my love. I promise that Mama and Papa are going to take care of you no matter what. Protect you always. Oh, grief. Why are you two here? To make you feel better. That's a laugh, if you don't mind. No, let us speak. Why should I? Nothing good seems to come of it when you open your mouth. George Crafter, your manners. We wish to throw you a party. A party? Are you mad? Well, it is your birthday in three days. We should celebrate. With family. It's the least we can do. Well, I'm sorry. I'm not interested. Now, if you don't mind, I have to work tomorrow. Uh, party! If you don't mind. Oh, Excuse me. Hello, Miss Newsom. Thank you for coming, Henry. I don't know how I can help you. Henry, I'm desperate. Well, I can see that. You called me. How well do you know George's family? Only what he has told me about them. Didn't you meet them all? Yes, but it was only a quick visit last year, and they all seemed pleasant enough. Even the scary witch? Well, she didn't present herself as such at the time. So you know nothing about them? 
I know a few of them are ladies of easy virtue, but George thinks very highly of them. Yes, well, that's plain as day, isn't it? He left me at the altar because of them. Henry, can you talk to the Newfoundland police and find out everything you can about them? You don't trust them. George and I met most of them when we went last year. There was no hint of this curse, even though it was clear that George and I were together. I'll do what I can. So, we're a team then? For better or worse. Hmm. Good day. Thank you, Henry. You didn't open it. I sure did not. You want to stand back. This is not for the faint-hearted. What's that supposed to mean? It means someone's pulled a fast one. Detective Murdoch. Miss Cherry. Anything to report on the murderous zombie? Other than the fact that I am not pursuing a murderous zombie? No. So he can run free on the streets. Miss Cherry. Constable Higgins. You are well? What do you want? Do you have any friends at the Tribune in St. John's? I may. May I impose upon you a favor? As long as you remember my golden rule. Tit for tat. You should cancel our subscription to this rag. Is that so? Look at this drivel. Miss Louise Cherry has clearly lost her mind. And who would believe such rubbish? Miss Cherry is not stupid. But you think it could be true? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to think. Look at this. What on earth is this? I don't know. Who left it? No idea. You can't think. Don't be foolish. He's dead. So you are going to pursue this? I'm just going to ask a few questions. Even though Trevor told you to let the matter lie. I won't involve him or the police. Must be Timothy and the gang. Please don't bring up the robbery. I need to talk to you two. Well, it's simple. We'll just leave. And he's following you? He's in New York. He didn't follow me here. I lost him. But it's just a matter of time. Probably. What do you suggest? Well, he seems like the kind of man who could be bought. So no legal recourse? For your kind, likely no. That's why I told you to stay out of this Trevor business. Mm. But I do appreciate you taking the time to warn us about this. Of course. Uh, I couldn't use your telephone, could I? <laughs> yes, uh... Station House 4, Toronto, Ontario, and I'd like to speak to Detective William Murdoch, please. Let the fun begin. I do hope Samuel is tucked in for the evening. Sir, are you quite sure? The coffin was empty. It was. And the recipient had no knowledge of why it was delivered to him. Did he have any knowledge of a Maurice Majors? No. So Mrs. Hart is definitely up to something. It's possible. Uh, any luck finding Jack Walker? I found them both, Watts and Walker. Oh. Listen, Murdoch, I'll be back in a day or so. Right now, I'm about to have a drink with some lads, so I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Good evening. Uh, hello. <laughs> you have a name? Uh, Thomas. Uh, well, Tom, I'm Tim. Let me grab you a drink.
You have a table? And don't tell me there are no dogs allowed. Not an Irishman, either. <laughs> You're dead. Is that so? News to me. Hey, this animal and I need sustenance. We're mighty hungry. Like, you move when I say you move. Or I'll snap your neck and this girl knows where your next needle's coming from. What do you want? What do you think? I want your money. What is it they say? Uh, your money or your life? I can't get you money. Not without Violet's permission. <laughs> That's funny. Damn, I taught that woman well. Well, then. You best get her permission. Or I'm gonna choose the second option. Son. Come on, girl. Take a seat. This fella's gonna make us a decent meal. You were to come down for tea. I don't like doing this. George is a good man. I don't like to see him suffer. It won't be much longer. His birthday is fast approaching, and then it'll be over. And he can marry her and be as poor and happy as he wants. <laughs> Enjoying yourself? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A bunch of lads. Oh, excuse me, boys. <laughs> the little fella on the couch even likes footy. Oh, footy? It sounds intriguing. Perhaps you could teach me. So do you have a place to stay while you visit our fair city? Uh, could I have a moment? <laughs> Cheeky. Didn't want things to get awkward. <laughs> it wouldn't. I don't bat for your team. And anyway, I'm a married man. So was I. Amanda, man, I, I need to know. Am I going to be able to keep my son, Samuel? It will be difficult if the police get involved. Difficult? You'll lose him. His mother's parents have claim. He's my child. They'll show you not fit. I'm his father. I know. But the police won't care. <laughs> I'd build a life in Toronto, and I'd lose it. How is that just? He was dead when I buried him. I don't understand. Apparently he wasn't. He was dead. You said so yourself. Well, it appears in this case you are not the only one wrong. We should go to the police. And what do you intend to tell them? That the man you tried to kill is after us? We cannot do that. Oh, Lord. I'm sorry. I did it for you. I know, Arthur. And I love you for it. But the police will not solve the problem of Maurice for us. Open up. I'm not going away, George. I know you're in there. Henry, I appreciate your concern, but I'm not in the mood for consolation. I'm not here to console you. I have something you want to hear. I discovered something suspicious about your anchor Santa. Your aunt was charged with two counts of fraud in St. John's in the last five years. Well, that's not surprising, Higgins. None of my aunts are angels. I know that, George. How did you find this out? Effie inquired with a legal firm. They provided the information. Effie's involved. What did I just say? So she still cares? Surprisingly, yes. Uh, so what shenanigans was Aunt Chrysanthemum up to this time? The charges also involved your Aunt Oleander. Do you want to know what I think? I sure do. You've been coming up sixes so far. There may be a reason other than your bride's demise why your Aunt Chrysanthemum and Oleander don't want you to marry. And that reason may be nefarious. So what do we do? Well, we need to figure out what they're up to. 
Let's do that. We need some help. Those who dwelt in the east and the west were indeed wicked witches. But now that you have killed one of them, there is but one wicked witch in all the land of Oz, the one who lives in the west. That's not actually true. Witches are not real, not in this world, despite what your Uncle George Crabtree might think. Mm. William, no need to stifle her imagination. Oh, I thought you'd be pleased I'm no longer reading to her from the periodic table of the elements. Coming to bed? Um, not quite yet. It seems my current investigation has me tied to Mrs. Hart. Speaking of witches. <laughs> Julia. There we are. Good night, Susanna. <laughs> night. Do you want to know about Morris Mages? If you're truthful. I've drunk enough to be truthful. For starters, I did not kill him. In fact, he might not even be dead. What are you talking about? That's not the point right now. An empty glass. Now, that's the point. <laughs> <clears throat> Mr. Majors had me banged to rights for a crime that I committed. It was years, years ago, but a crime nonetheless. <clears throat> oh, wine. Mm. <clears throat> Back to you and Mr. Majors. Majors was a known accomplice of a man named Walter Milton. Now, he was a piece of work. I knew him to be responsible for the death of two working girls, but I couldn't prove it. And I doubt anyone cared much about their death. No, they did not. But I did. I had a friendship with them. And no, not like that. Anyway, I caught a break. An associate of Milton's was killed. I found evidence that put Milton at the scene of the murder. So I brought him in and charged him. And how did this become a problem for Mr. Majors? Majors produced a sworn statement that said he was he was with Milton at the time of the murder. I destroyed it. But Milton did kill his associate. No, he did not. Oh. But he did kill the two women. Majors pleaded for Milton's innocence, accused me of all manner of things. Some of them true, but no one believed him. No one would take the word of a black man over that of an honest copper. And you were the honest copper? And an Englishman to boot. Fair play and all that. I was seeking justice for the two dead women and all the others that were unfortunate enough to cross Milton's path. You broke the law. Stopped a man from saving his friend's life. And more than likely saved the lives of many others. It wasn't noble, but it had to be done. What, you don't believe me? I have a man in this very building afraid to go to the police because the police here don't follow the law and instead do whatever they think is right. Should we not be held to a higher standard than those honest coppers? Oh, I don't know what's. All I know is I took a murderer off the street. On my word, I had nothing to do with the possible demise of Maurice Majors. And you think Violet Hart is behind all this? She could be. And behind what exactly? What crime did she possibly commit? She authorized the shipment of a coffin said to contain her father's body to New York City. That coffin had no body in it. And you think he's behind these two murders at the graveyard? I don't know that, but he is a suspect. If he's still alive, and you want me to question her? No, I'd like you to be there when I question her. Oh. There's no reason to believe my father's body was not in the coffin. Except for the fact that it wasn't. Inspector Brackenreed has confirmed this himself. He's confirmed nothing. Someone could have easily tampered with the body during transport. And who would do that? I must say, I don't know. Everything appears to be in order. The fact remains that the man is not dead. I examined him. I declared a cause of death. It's all right there. Perhaps you made a mistake. It does happen. You were distraught. He was your father. Perhaps you overlooked something. I was not distraught. I didn't even care for the man. The only thing that has happened here is a dead man's body has gone missing. I don't think that that is all that has happened here. Oh, no, of course. I've pronounced my father dead and then had him buried alive. 
Is that the sort of thing you would think me capable of? Mrs. Hart, I don't think we have begun to explore the depths of what you are capable of. We're not accusing you of anything nefarious here. You may not be, Dr. Ogden, but your husband certainly is. I would like to take your report with me. Of course. My father's death is a matter of public record. You are welcome to it. Observations? She's hiding something. My thoughts exactly. Impossible to prove without a body. I believe there is a body. I believe it to be alive, and I intend to prove it. I should get back to the clinic. Hopefully my patient is still there. Ah, oh, yes. If you need any help... Of course. Although, I think you might be the one who needs it. I'd like you to stay another day. My husband needs me at home. Yes, and your body needs to rest. I simply stumbled and fell. I will be fine. Why don't you tell me the truth? It is the truth. I was a coroner for many years. I've seen my fair share of violent injuries. You didn't fall down the stairs. Someone did this to you. That is your word against mine. I also examined you closely. You were taken by force, were you not? I don't know what you're talking about. Sexually? You were physically assaulted? I'm going home. To the source of the problem? I don't know what you're talking about. You and I both know what I'm talking about. This matter is concluded. There you are. Let's have a look. Oh, it certainly looks 15 years older. Very good, Irving. Let's get this to the printer. I want it up all over the city as soon as possible. Hello, Effie. George. Is it all right that I'm here? I'm trying to figure out what your aunts are up to. You might as well be a part of it. I, uh... Jeez, Louise! Ah, the reluctant bridegroom. I'm only joking. Sit down. Why are you... What? I... I can't help but wonder what you're doing here. What do you think I'm doing here? I'm here to help. George, I must say, you come from a strangely fascinating family. Violet. That's right. Is it true? Is what true? This. Is your father alive? Of course not. Detective Murdoch has clearly lost his mind. That doesn't seem likely. It seems more likely that your father is alive could very well be the one who broke into our salon. That is ridiculous. Why would you say that? I found this behind the cabinet where we store the liquor. Isn't this the watch he was showing off? I was going to give that to the police. I'll do that. Good day, Miss Bright. That was my neighbor who was robbed. He gave me a name. You don't think you have more pressing matters? Like a man trying to take your friend's son away from you? I understand that, but these people are untrustworthy of the police. I'm going to give them reason to reconsider that. Thanks for your help, Inspector. I thought I'd lost you. Well, I'm better than you thought. Go home, Feldy. Burn a paycheck? I think not. Uh, I'm going to return this child to a decent home, and you're going to help me. Not a chance. You think so? I like that. Mm -hmm. See, this sure don't look like the policeman's ball to me, does it? It's not as it seems. I know exactly how it seems. My question is, how long do you remain on the police force if these get into the wrong hands? Have a lovely day, Inspector.
Still can't believe the dog came back to the graveyard. And that she did. Figured either she run off on her own or died, or maybe the killer took her. Any luck? Still none, I'm afraid. But uh, thank you for bringing her in. Guess I'm keeping her now. I don't believe the zombie story, you know. Oh, good. good. Then you're a sensible man. I've seen it twice before in my life, you know. Men buried before their time. Tried to get a fellow out once, but I was too late. Maybe this one got a second chance at life. This one was even featured in the Tribune. Your Aunt Oleander predicted a mine collapse. Yes, I remember that. I was just a young lad. My aunts all raced over to the mine and demanded the workers all get out. Everybody thought they were mad, and then the mine filled in. There were accounts for over a month of rain. It was a coincidence. If she didn't see it, why would she say it? People have premonitions all the time, George. Sometimes they are right, and sometimes they are wrong. Yes, but Aunt Oleander is always right. She predicted when my Uncle Lewis died at sea. She predicted that when my Aunt Lily had a baby, he would be born with six toes. Hence, six-toed Simon. You met Simon? He was lovely. Did you know he had six toes? No. Well, my Aunt Oleander did, even before he was born. And I think this time she is wrong. So what do I do? I, I, I go ahead and marry Effie. Hardly your decision alone now, George. And say, damn the consequences? I can't do that. I, I couldn't live with myself if it turned out my aunt was right. All we're saying is that your aunts might be up to something. Yes, trying to save your life. Maybe George is right. Maybe that's all it is. We'll see. I've been in contact with a lawyer who represents George's family. He was an old professor of mine. Somewhere in his files, he may have an answer. And what will compel him to surrender those to you? I may have told him, but I am now Mrs. George Crabtree, and I am representing my husband. If there's anything pertinent, he will forward the information to me. Does George know that you're doing this? He does not, Henry. He might not like what you're doing. I don't care if he likes it or not. George Crabtree is not the only wronged party here. Henry, didn't you tell me that George recently witnessed one of Oleander's predictions that came true? That I did. Perhaps you could find out something about the circumstances surrounding that. Who brought these to you? What's the matter? You want them or not? Uh, they were stolen from a friend of mine. Huh? Uh, I wouldn't know. If you are not forthcoming, I will be forced to go to the police. Why don't you do that, huh? It was a policeman who brought them here. And did you see Mr. Majors do this? No. I believe he broke into my establishment. Before he disappeared, he showed a keen interest in it. A keen interest? He wanted to buy it out from under me. Well, and you believe he's stealing from you now? I think he's trying to harass me, scare me. Thing is, he doesn't know me. I don't scare. Do you have any proof of this? I'm sure he was in the club. I found his pocket watch behind the cabinet when we stored the liquor. Oh. Do you have it? I gave it to Mrs. Hart. She said she would make sure it made its way to you. I suppose you're right. You don't really have a choice. You don't have a choice about what? We have to leave this city with Samuel. I can stall this private detective, buy you some time. That's the solution? We run? There's no answer. You know who ransacked Trevor's apartment? New York City police. What can we do about that? Nothing. If you run, you can start a new life. Living on the run is not a new life. It's not even a life. Can I help you? Mr. Prescott, I'm Dr. Julia Ogden. I am familiar with the name. 
I treated your wife. I came to see how she's faring. She is faring well, thank you very much. And she thanks you for your assistance. Uh, could I see her for myself? You cannot. I'm a physician. She's under my care. And I am her husband, and she is under mine. If you take another step, I shall have no choice but to call the police. Uh, it is I who should be calling the police on you. Don't be preposterous. Good day. Mrs. Hart. Detective. When were you planning on giving it to me? Excuse me? Your father's watch, the one he misplaced while he was burglarizing your partner's nightclub. It is my nightclub as well. He must have lost it there back when he was still alive. I see. But Miss Bright did want you to give it to me as evidence. And I neglected to give it to you promptly. My mistake. Of course. Your report states that your father's cause of death was cerebral hemorrhaging. Yes, I'm aware of that. I wrote it. It also notes that there were significant traces of cocaine in his bloodstream. Which I speculated may have been the cause of the embolism. It's quite easy for you to obtain cocaine, is it not? Despite the law, it is easy for any number of people to get their hands on cocaine. And as I remember, my father was a very heavy user. He often said it would be the death of him. So I guess George Crabtree's aunt isn't the only one with the ability to foretell the future. Do you need any assistance, sir? Not at this time, George. I know you don't think highly of my decision, sir, but I couldn't risk it. I couldn't risk that my aunt was right. You know my thoughts on this, George. I'm very skeptical of seers and psychics and the like. Well, what would you do? I I'm not so sure that I would be willing to risk losing the chance at being happy. Sir, if you need any help. If you truly want to help me, George, find me a dead man. Are you sure? The coach that George saw run down that man was hired by his anchor, Santham. And you're sure it's the same coach? The owner claimed to have found damages. They arranged the accident. So those two are playing a game. To what end? Those witches! What? I've just received a wire from my old professor. The lawyer. Yes, the lawyer, Henry. And now I know why George cannot marry. At least not until tomorrow. His birthday? I think those two deserve a good scare. Louise. Yes? I have a favor to ask of you. Can we come in? Yes, of course. Charming. Well, I haven't exactly been at my best recently. Well, that is about to change, George. How so? It's very simple, George. You and I are going to get married. I'm delighted, George. Well, after the week I've had, I think I deserve a birthday party. And you've both come all the way to Toronto to save my bride's life. I just did my duty. And I thank you for that. I'm sorry I had to tell you the truth. Yes, but in doing so, you saved Miss Newsom's life. I mean, it was her you saw in your vision, wasn't it? She was. So you did the right thing, didn't you? Well, I will begin arrangements. We will have a grand time, George. Please feel free to bring any of your friends. Yes, I will do. Uh, thank you, and I'll see you both at the party tomorrow. Don't look so sour, Oleander. We are not doing the right thing for him. He is a good man. He deserves to be happy. 
You can't go to the police about this. Some of them are breaking the law. You'll just make this worse for you and your kind. My kind? What am I, a different species? Bloody hell, Watts. Get off your high horse and listen to me for one minute. I can help you if you can help me. Is that how one finds justice? By making deals? Do you want the police to stop harassing your friends or not? I do. And do you want Jack to be able to keep Sam? Then let me handle the police. Right. I need you to go to an apartment, and when you see that private investigator leave... The men are still out looking, sir, but there have been no sightings or reports. Mr. Majors is likely long gone if he has any sense. Have the men return to their regular duties, but keep an eye out. I will. Uh, sir, may I have the afternoon off? I suppose so. Uh, George's aunts are throwing a party. It's his birthday. Is George up for this? Oh, I think he is. William, I think you should arrest me for assault. Oh, what have you done, Julia? Alderman Prescott has blocked my access to all of the medical supply houses in town. How can he do that? He told them that it was in their best interest to not do business with me. I can get things from Buffalo, but it will take a long time. Uh, uh, Julia, I should advise you to steer well clear of him. Uh oh, I will. But he will soon be made well aware of just who he has taken on. All right. See you at home. Yes. Mrs. Hart. Dr. Ogden, are you my next inquisitor? Oh, I'm not here about that. And if you made a mistake, it was an honest one. Thank you. I need your access to get these supplies. If you can have them delivered to the morgue, I can get them to the clinic. Why can't you get those? Someone in high places is trying to punish me, and in doing so is punishing women throughout the city. Perhaps I could kill him. Uh, a joke, Dr. Ogden. Who is this someone? Uh, an Alderman Prescott. Adrian Prescott? Yes. One moment. I have something. Oh? It's a ledger from a night spot that I'm part owner of. Oh, yes, the Star Bright Club. <sighs> I'm surprised I haven't seen you there. Well, I have had my hands full a little lately. <laughs> of course. My partner has been making payments to Mr. Prescott to ensure the place stays open. Uh, he's been taking bribes. He has, indeed. And I can give you more information if you need. <gasps> well, thank you, Mrs. Hart. <laughs> thank you very much. Always a pleasure to welcome a neighbor from the north. How can I help you? It's not a pleasant visit, I'm afraid. It's been brought to my attention that some of the men from your precinct have been indulging in thievery. I've received no such reports. They've been too scared to come forward. Those fears are unfounded. I run an honest precinct. I don't think you do. Who were these victims? Residents of flats in Greenwich Village. Oh, the lavender lollies have their knickers in a twist. They don't deserve to be preyed upon by the New York Police Department. And I don't need some Canuck telling me how to run my precinct. I may reside and work in the frozen north, but I'm an Englishman 100%, Paddy. Now, would you rather Theodore Roosevelt told you? What are you talking about? The former president and one-time commissioner of this very force. Well, I know who he is. Well, he's a good friend of mine, and he owes me a favor. Some of my men, Canucks, saved his life. Now, he worked very hard to combat corruption on this force. I don't think you'd be pleased with your stewardship. In fact, I would guess you'd be in for a rough ride. So what do you want? I want any goods stolen from the residents of Greenwich Village returned to their rightful owners. And any of your men patrolling down there to act like policemen and not criminals. And Mr. Roosevelt? If you do what I ask, you'll be none the wiser. Then you have it. Good. Oh, and uh, one more thing. What is the meaning of this? Huh? I've done nothing, nothing wrong. You are conducting an unauthorized investigation in my precinct. I want you out of here. Do you know what this man is? Do you know what this man is protecting? Not my concern. He is allowing two known 
homosexuals to corrupt a child, a child to God-fearing people have a legal claim to. That is a Canadian matter. It's not my concern. Go home. Your career is over. Do your worst, Feldy. I'll be ready. We'll see. We'll see. Your son is yours. Thank you. And the private investigator? He's been sent back to Canada. He won't bother you again. You hear that, Samuel? Did you get them? I did. Broke into someone's home just like a regular policeman. Is this all of them? All I could find. What are those? Photographs that could ruin my career. You risked a lot for us. Thank you. It was the only way it was. Now you two can live the life you choose. I told you to leave me alone. Yes, I'm not one to listen, Mr. Prescott. This is Detective William Murdoch. I know damn well who he is. What do you want? You're under arrest, Mr. Prescott. That's ridiculous. On what charge? Accepting bribes. We have a number of witnesses who've signed affidavits to the fact. I'm sure their word means nothing. That's why we're also looking into your bank accounts. You see, money never lies. Please come with me. I will not. Then I will have no choice but to instruct my constables to take you by force. That should be quite a sight for your neighbors, I'd imagine. What are you doing? I told you I didn't... This has nothing to do with you, Mrs. Prescott. Your husband is a criminal. And if you choose, you're a free woman. I hope you have thanked Oleander for saving your life. Oh, many times over. And where is George? Well, he said he would be along shortly. Uh, he also said that he had a surprise for the two of you. Oh, well, there's no need for that. It is his birthday. Well, I think he's just glad I'm not dead. Mm. As am I, of course. Ah! Here he is! The man of the hour is here! George! Who's this? On Chrysanthemum, Aunt Oleander, I'd like to introduce you to my bride, Mrs. Louise Cherry. I'll be taking his name. Bride? Yes, married just this morning. George and I were an item at one time. Yeah, and I had vowed to be married by this age. And since Effie was doomed to die. Well, I jumped at the chance with Louise here. <sighs> but she's going to die. Oh, she's not. It's Miss Newsom I saw perish. You didn't see anyone perish. <laughs> the only thing you saw perish was her inheritance. I don't know what you're talking about. I spoke to Mr. Penny. Our lawyer. Your Aunt Astrid was a very unusual woman, was she not? George was to inherit her fortune. That is, unless he remained a bachelor too long. Then he would be deemed to be useless, and her inheritance would go to you instead. I will just leave. No, you will not. I'm so sorry, George. I would have confessed to the fraudulence as soon as it were safe to do so. And as soon as she had George's money. And Chris. Aunt Leanne. George, I am in terrible trouble. I wouldn't have done this unless I had to. She's in debt to a loan shark, a very bad man. It was the only way I could help her. But now that you are wed, the money is all yours. Please just let me run. Let me run and I will never trouble you again. And if I marry Effie, she won't die. I cannot promise that, but it is not foretold. But you are already married. We just wanted to throw you a little scare. You deserve that. <laughs> Trevor's coin collection was returned with an apology. Service with a smile. So is this what we do now? Make deals instead of follow the law? Oh, get over yourself, Watts. I've heard you say many times that the law is not justice, that the law is not always right. So you change the law. You don't break it. I saved your friend's son. You're not going to make me feel bad about that. And you should know, you're welcome back in my station house anytime. Your choice. 
Thank you, but I don't know if that's what I want anymore. I believe this belongs to you. <laughs> Thank you. That would be a shame. The Force could use more good men like you. Good luck, Watts. Thank you, William. It was a good thing we did today. What will happen to Mrs. Prescott? I don't know. But whatever it is, it will be of her choosing. Hmm. And what of your case? Remains unsolved, I'm afraid. I suspect Mr. Majors has left Toronto. But you still think he's alive? Well, I suspect as much. Hmm? And so what now? I can prove nothing. And I'm not quite sure of Mrs. Hart's involvement in all of this. But my case is at a dead end. Are you giving up? I can't just keep chasing ghosts. But sooner or later, either Mr. Majors or Mrs. Hart will reveal something. Until then, I am biding my time. Where's the nanny? So, you going to turn them both in? They're my aunt's Effie. They've had hard lives. And besides trying to fool me and nearly ruining my life, they haven't done anything wrong. No. What? You're going to give her the money, aren't you? She's in trouble. George, after all they put you through. Yes, of course. Maybe we'll keep a little something for the trip, but we don't need the money. You and I are you and Louise Cherry. <laughs> Please. Come on. What do you think? I can't promise you won't drop dead the minute you say yes. I need to go home. What? I paid a pretty penny for that dress. It's going to be used. Led that private investigator to you. But I found Samuel and I anyway. It won't stop. Misfortune follows us. You two will lead a more peaceful life without me. Yeah. Yeah. Are you leaving for good? I don't know, Jack. I'm not a happy man. I'm not happy with myself, and until I am, I shouldn't be here. <clears throat> Where are you going to go? That's something I don't have the answer to yet. But... My life won't stop once you leave. <clears throat> Nor should it. Till the next time. We need to find my father. Detective Murdoch will find out he's alive, and then he'll discover our role in all of this. And I best stay well hidden, wouldn't you say? I'd hate for something ill to fall upon my loving daughter. So, Violet, take a seat. We can have a nice family dinner and discuss our current situation. Sit. Mm. Your husband has found excellent suppliers. The fish could be a little fresher, but uh, we do with the best we can with what we're given in this world, do we not? It's jambalaya. I learned how to make it during my time down in New Orleans. That's a place where you would prosper, Violet. A city full of fraudsters. It's made from as many ingredients as you'd like. Come on, a multitude of different tastes. Some bold, some almost imperceptible. You can't even tell what you're ingesting. Not like that 
speedball you gave me, Arthur. <laughs> that almost took me off this earth. Try some. I learned some things from a voodoo woman down there. She was something. She taught me how to put myself in a trance so deep. It was hard to tell if I was dead or alive. But you know that now, don't you, Father? You don't like it? I don't have much of an appetite. I would have thought you'd have chosen a better man. Now, see here! Don't! I'm already embarrassed for you. How about you, Violet? You always had such an appetite when you were young. I made this special for you. You think I'd do the same to you that you did to me? I'd never be so lily livered. Mmm. Delicious. If I do say so myself. You two don't know what you're missing. important that we establish some trust while I'm here. I can give you money, any, anything you want. Just, just leave. Oh, I'm staying for a while. I'm interested in seeing how much crime a dead man can get away with. Detective Murdoch suspects you're still alive. He best not find me then, because if he does, both you and your spineless husband go down with me. Bon appetit. You don't know. Losing weight lately, I heard. Mm-mm-mm! Yes! Here it is, Henry. Crabtree, you're late. Your shift started two hours ago. Sorry, sir. I'll be docking your pay. Well, that sounds more than reasonable. I was attending to something very important. I couldn't wait a moment longer. Gentlemen, it's been a while coming, but I would like to introduce you to my wife. Mrs. Effie Crabtree. I'll see he makes it to work on time in the future, Inspector. <laughs> Congratulations, oh, thank George. You, thank you. Congratulations, you little bugalogs. Oh, you bugalogs. Well done, George. Wonderful. Oh. Wonderful. You must come for dinner. Oh, this is just... Oh, this must be a special occasion. If William is drinking wine, this will prove amusing later on. I would like to propose a toast to my dear friend George Crabtree and his lovely new bride, Effie. I wish you a life of good fortune and happiness. To George and Effie. Thank you, sir. Effie. Mm -hmm. oh. mm. Ah, look at us, George. Both happily married men now. Yes, and lucky ones at that, I should say, sir. I should give him wine more often. This is a special occasion, because I've ventured back into the kitchen. <laughs> Help yourselves. Uh, look at that. So, what are your plans? Well, oh, we plan to honeymoon once we get our affairs in order here. George has come into some money, and we plan on spending it recklessly. Oh, how marvelous. <laughs> Good man, George. I'm happy for you. Thank you, sir, as am I. Welcome to Wedded Bliss. Oh, I'll get her. So what are your plans after that? We haven't discussed that yet. Uh, at least four children, I should think. Four? Is that all? Well, yes, two boys, two girls. Or I don't know, one boy, three girls. I'm not fussy, but uh, I think a small family should satisfy me. Some more wine for you, detective? Oh, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, why not? <laughs> it's a special occasion, after all. And please, call me William. Uh, certainly after business hours. Oh, and when is it ever not business hours? <laughs> Zeta's first international convention of novelists as we write our city a new and glorious chapter in the arts. <laughs> Mr. Kipling, 
If you would be so kind as to do me the honor, sir. I used to read my boys the jungle book when they were this big. Put them to sleep every time. In a good way, of course. Name? Thomas Brackenreed. Brackenreed, R-E-I-D. Never heard of you. I'm not a writer. This is a private party. I'm accompanying my good friend, the great George Crabtree. Never heard of him either. Oh. Uh, oh, that's the chap over there. The author of two classic novels, the, oh, the titles of which escape me at the moment, but I assure you... Bloody hell. Come here. Not the gold mine I was hoping for. How many autographs so far, sir? One. I didn't know him either. I mistook him for Robert Service. I'm feeling a little out of depth myself. <sighs> Nonsense. These are your people. Get out there, start mingling. Oh, sir, have you seen who's here? Henry James, Edith Wharton, L. Frank Baum? I'm hardly worthy. You're an invited guest. And, sir, look where I am on the poster, right there at the very bottom. With all the other up-and-comers. And spelled with a G. George Grabtree. At a novelist convention. I am aware of the irony. Nobody here has the faintest idea who I am. Oh, until now, that is. Who's that? Lucy Maud Montgomery. The writer of Anne of Green Gardens. Cables. Uh, you know her? Oh, yes, sir. We became well acquainted. I inspired her main character. A little girl called Anne? Uh, sir, an orphan found in a carpet bag, wildly imaginative. That must be her fiancé she's with. I heard she became engaged. But I have no doubt, sir. She'll thank me. Just watch. For your troubles. You must have made quite the impression. Right, well, that's me for the night. I'm off. Well, if you're leaving, so am I. Anyway, how much fun could we possibly miss? All right, a tipsy ferret it is then. Oh, thank you. Alfred Pope, one of the writers at the opening cocktail party last night. That's the man I mistook for Robert Service. We should have stuck around longer. You spoke with this man? Around 9.30. He seemed well enough at the time. I must have gotten his final signature. Do you think that ups the value? What have you, Mrs. Hart? It looks like his heart's been penetrated by a single jab. He's been dead a few hours at least. Who found the body? Uh, the cleaner, sir. She found him this morning. Apparently, the revelry went on into the early hours. Someone was sending a message. Indeed. Pages from a book? Sir, I found several books scattered about the room, but none of them were missing any pages. Seems to be some writing on one side as well. Red ink, perhaps? Not a wise choice if you want someone to read it. Right, George, once Mrs. Hart is finished with the murder weapon and the accompanying pages, please bring them to my office. We also need to speak with all of the guests in order to retrace Mr. Pope's final steps. I'm on it. Excuse me, Constable. Lord, do you have any idea why the convention's been postponed? I'm afraid there's been a murder. Oh, my Lord. Who? Well, we'll make an announcement once we notify the next of kin. To think that I was trying to sneak in here last night. I was hoping to slip one of them my stories. Last night, you say? When? Around 10. And were you able to get in? Were there any doors unlocked? Uh, they, they were sealed tight, I'm afraid. I even tried the windows. But did you notice anything unusual? Anybody lurking about? Besides yourself, I suppose. I'm afraid not. Right, well... If you remember anything, anything at all, I would appreciate you letting me know. I'm Constable George Crabtree. I'm at Station House 4. George Crabtree? The writer? Yes, that's right. Do I know you? No, but I know you. Curse of the Pharaohs, a man alone. I'm a huge fan, sir. Your words are south to the soul. Oh, I don't know about that. I'm Norman Bean. I fancy myself a bit of a writer, too. Oh, is that right? I'm very excited to be in your presence. I can't help but think that this is fate. Would you allow me to follow you around for a day? 
I could help out if you'd like. I'd love to delve into the brain of George Crabtree. Really? I beg your pardon, is this seat taken? Um, I suppose not. <sighs> I suppose everyone turned away from the novelist convention ended up here. Indeed. I heard there may have been a murder. Uh, it's true, I'm afraid. My husband's a detective on the case. The cop profession, to be sure. I used to be a city coroner. That's where we met. Oh, ghastly. And yet perversely fascinating. Do you miss it? Uh, I'd be lying if I said I didn't, but life had greater adventures in store. <laughs> I suppose so. I didn't quit because of my child, if that's what you're implying. Half the trouble in life is caused by pretending there isn't any. Well, I'll have you know I'm still very active in the medical field. Edith Wharton would not appreciate you twisting her words like that. Forgive me. I, I have a nasty habit of overstepping. I guess we have that in common. Perhaps my name might help excuse the blunder. I'm Edith Wharton. Oh, my. You are. My lecture's been postponed. Any suggestions on what one might do to while away a few hours in this town? Uh. Mr. Kipley, remember me? I'm on police business this time. Are you familiar with an Alfred Pope? Uh, I heard. It's terrible. And I heard that you were one of the last people to leave the party. Did you exchange words with him by any chance? I'll tell you what I'd know, but you'll have to buy me a drink. Although I doubt very much you'd be familiar with it. Try me. A pisco sour. Pisco, lime juice, simple syrup, egg whites, Agostura bitters. Impressive. Uh, did you also know that it was a favorite of that anti-imperialist bastard, Mark Twain? May he rest in peace. Who do you think I got the recipe from? Join me for a tipple. <laughs> Sir, any luck isolating the red ink? Not much, I'm afraid. Tried a number of different light settings, including ultraviolet, but nothing seems to be working. I wonder if there's a way to remove the blood chemically. Precisely what I was thinking. However, I will need you to transcribe the text from these pages so we can still identify the book should the process compromise the ink. I assumed as much. I took the liberty while you were with the inspector. Oh. Well, then, I need you to track down Alfred Pope's wife. Let her know I need to speak with her. Sir, I've done so, and she's available this afternoon. Very good, very good. Then perhaps you and the inspector should create a timeline of Alfred Pope's final interactions. Uh, well, George, your efficiency is noted. How did you find the time? Tea is ready, sir. Ah, Norman. Needs one more sugar. Very good, sir. You've taken an assistant. I'll take Mrs. Pope's address now, please. Right, right. For 300 miles in 20 days, we push through sandstorms and searing heat, our rations waning, only to emerge at Kandahar in time to blow Ayub Khan and his cowardly lances back to the Stone Age. <laughs> <laughs> Take up the white man's burden. Send forth the best ye breed. Bind your sons to exile to serve thy captain. Gives need. <laughs> I must say, it's a pleasure to drink with the son of the Empire. Ah, well, I do appreciate your respect for law and order. And I will keep an ear open. Whoever took down Pope must be apprehended. I've, no one ever said a bad word about him. May God rest his soul. Ah. 
see you brought your book again. Ah, pretend you didn't see it. <laughs> but what if I pretended I did see it and I signed it? But that's what you want, isn't it? You'd consider it? Uh, I'll do you one better. I am winnowing a series of essays on sea warfare for an upcoming collection, and I could use the advice of a war veteran such as yourself. <laughs> I would be honored, Mr. Kipling. Call me Rudyard. Rudyard. I still can't believe Alfred is dead. We just booked a trip to Hawaii. He had boasted of visits to Kilauea in his books, but he never actually went. It was our little secret. Now he'll never go. When did you last see your husband? We went to the cocktail party together. I felt a little out of place, and so I left around 11. He offered to take me home, but I insisted that he stay and enjoy himself. Did you notice anything unusual? Any tension with one of the writers, perhaps? No, of course not. When I left, he was telling a joke. The last thing I heard was his stupid laugh. Do you know of anyone who may have wished your husband harm? Alfred was respected by his peers. His books didn't sell well, so he wasn't in competition with anyone. It doesn't make any sense. We found pages affixed to your husband's body. We transcribed them. Do you recognize any of this text? They're from his upcoming book, Killian's Folly. He'd just been sent a box of advanced copies, but as far as I know, it's unopened. It's a thinly veiled mm. assault on the literary mm. community. Mm. What's more, three of the books were missing from a box. He likely distributed them to his fellow novelists. And you think if we find them, we may find our culprit? Possibly. It also means that everyone, including Kipling, is a suspect. Not to mention a skinflint. He stiffed me on the bill. Are you sure we're not overthinking this? Sir, the book lampoons the literary community. It creates caricatures out of a number of famed authors, or so George tells me. There's no such thing as bad press. Mrs. Hart, you have news? Uh, yes, I've completed the post-mortem, and I have a smaller time frame for Pope's time of death. He died between midnight and 2 a.m. Well, that makes sense. We've established that the party continued past midnight. Yet all the writers that I've checked with, including Kipling, Lucy Maud, and Edith Wharton, all say they left the party well before midnight. And none of them recall interacting with Pope, which I find odd. Anything else? Actually, yes. I examined the brown liquid on the victim's shirt, and I found sugars mixed with some type of alcohol. Someone must have spilled a drink on him before doing him in. That wasn't the only odd finding. There was also a crusty substance, which proved to be the proteins of egg white. Who would put an egg white in a drink? Bloody hell. A piece goes sour. Meaning what, exactly? Meaning I need to go and visit a friend. As I told old Tommy boy, I was nowhere near Pope that night. Then how do you explain the traces of Pisco Sour on his shirt? All right. So, he and I had a bit of a row. He called my writing jingoistic claptrap, and I responded accordingly. What time did you last see him? North of midnight, uh, events began to blur. So it's possible you were with him at the time he was murdered. If you're implying what I think you're implying, I'd tread lightly. You lied about your perception of the victim. You lied about when you last saw him, and you lied about your argument. You seem to have a problem with facts, Mr. Kipling. The facts are Alfred Pope resented my success and he was a self-entitled chowderhead. He deserved a pisco sour on his shirt. He did not deserve to die. I did not kill him, and he was alive when I left him. All right. Can you at least tell me who was with him at that time? 
Yes, I can, in fact. He was in the rare book room, getting forward with a certain Lucy Maud Montgomery. Sir, any luck? The blood and the ink have somehow fused. No matter how I adjust my hydrogen peroxide chemical bath, I can't seem to remove one without removing the other. Might be quite effective for cleaning a stain, though, sir. Uh, you asked for me. Yes. Lucy Maud Montgomery has been placed alone at the scene with the victim. I need you to bring her in. Is that a problem, George? Sir, no. Three sugars this time. Yeah, no, <laughs> thank you. I owe you. It's it's funny you say that. My my story. I was hoping that you could read it. Um, if when you're not so busy. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Um, I've got some police duty to attend to right now, but I'll give this read as soon as possible. Thank you, sir. Lucy Maud Montgomery. Oh, coat check boy. Still, you really don't remember me. But you took my class. We had a moment. I'm sorry. You must have me mistaken for someone else. Now, if you'll excuse me. Well, actually, Miss Montgomery, this is not a social call. What were you and Mr. Pope discussing in the rare book room? Nothing. I helped him dry his shirt, that's all. Mr. Kipling intimated that he may have been getting forward with you. <laughs> you can't possibly be taking anything, Mr. Kipling. Mr. Kipling is wrong. Alfred and I were friends, nothing more. Then why did you lie? I was afraid my fiancé would get the same idea as Mr. Kipling. What did the two of you talk about? Nothing coherent, anyway. He was more than a little drunk. Did he imply that he was under any sort of threat? No. I mean, Alfred could be abrasive, but he was very well respected. In truth, he was the writer we all aspired to be. He lived like a poet, died like a poet. <sighs> he couldn't have conceived of a more delicious ending if he wrote it himself. It was hardly a delicious ending. He was murdered. And you were one of the last people to see him alive. I, I swear to you, Detective, there was nothing odd about him when I left. Can you at least tell me who else may have been there? Uh, it's all a little blurry, but I believe Edith Wharton was still there. No hard feelings, Rudyard. You were just doing your job. <laughs> How's your book? The essays you were gathering on sea warfare. Excellent. I, I think I came up with an opener. It came to me uh, shortly after I was brought in for questioning. Oh, is that right? Mm, yeah. Could I see that book of yours? I'd just like to jot it down. Of course. Thank you. Uh, <sighs> That's it. Oh, yes, yes. It read a little something like, um, this. Hmm. Now we've never met. Huh. Ah. No hard feelings. So he just wasn't was there. Although it is possible Miss Montgomery's memory of the evening was compromised. Well, uh, sir, that is a phenomenon I have experienced personally. And Inspector Brackenreed says Miss Wharton claims to have been at her hotel. Well, yes, I confirmed as much with the concierge at the Empress. Uh, sirs, that's false. What's false? I'm embarrassed to admit that after failing to break into the 
the cocktail party, I heard that Edith Wharton was staying at the Empress. So I, I tipped a bellman to, to slip her my manuscript. Well, it's possible she pretended not to receive it. Perhaps, but, but the bellman insisted that, that not only was she not there, but that she had never been there. I, I, I knocked on her door myself. So if she said she left that party and went straight to her hotel room, then Edith Wharton is lying. Mm, I would love to go back to France. Mm -hmm. It's been far too long. Well, I don't know why anyone lives in America at all. It's, it's all right to visit, but it's not exactly Europe, is it? Mm -hmm. William! <laughs> My friend and I got into the wine. <laughs> I can see that. You won't believe who it is. She's very eager to meet you. That's why I'm here. You <laughs> left me a message at the station house. Uh oh. <laughs> Charmed. Julia has told me a great deal about you. <laughs> Did she also tell you that I need to bring you in for questioning? What? Oh, William, what are you saying? You're embarrassing me in front of my friend. Oh, she may be your friend, but she's also a suspect for murder. What were you doing between midnight and 2 a.m. last night? I was sleeping. Where? In my hotel. We've confirmed with the hotel bellman that you never returned last night. So where were you really? You can fix this, Mrs. Wharton. Just tell us where you were. I prefer to speak with my attorney. Fine. In the meantime, we have a lovely spot for you to sit and wait. You've thrown Edith Wharton in jail. We're giving her a chance to cool off. Maybe she'll decide to say something of substance. And you agree to this? She lied about her alibi. But perhaps she had a good reason. She was the last person seen in the company of a murder victim. Well, by a woman who was impaired. She refuses to answer any of our questions. What are we supposed to do? She's as stubborn as a mule. We're doing all we can. Well, not quite. Not exactly your country house in Lennox. <laughs> Edith, I want you to know that whatever you say to me will remain between us. How can I trust you? You're basically part of the constabulary. <sighs> I'm a woman. And even though we just met, I hope a friend. You lied about where you were. That's an unusual decision. This is a very serious murder investigation. I didn't have a choice. Well, please, help me understand. I love my husband very much. Teddy was once a joyous soul, but is no longer. Marriage can be complicated. Mine especially, I'm afraid. Teddy suffers from melancholia. Living with him is no longer viable. I needed an outlet. So you had an affair? His name is Morton Fullerton. And he's the foreign correspondent for the Times of London. Which is to say that he's the means to travel discreetly. It's an open secret. Emphasis on the word secret. So you fear the repercussions? The vultures want their carrion, Julia. Such is the cost of excelling in a man's field. This reminds me of a quote I read recently in a magazine excerpt. That life is just a perpetual piecing, piecing together, together of broken, broken bits. <laughs> Indeed. Apparently, I have far too many of them. Tell me where your friend is staying, and I promise to keep your secret. William? Any progress? Not much. I've managed to corrupt two pages, and I'm down to my last piece of evidence. 
No matter the formula, I can't seem to extract enough blood to reveal the red ink below. Sounds like quite the undertaking. It's like changing the tint of the ocean to see the fish. Why not change the fish? Focus on the ink. The peroxide bond is indeed weak and unstable. By switching the H2O2 with 3H60, you could let the acetone work on the message itself with minimal damage. Julia Ogden, I have never loved you more. <laughs> well, perhaps this is a very good time to ask for a favor. Anything. Release Edith Wharton. Except that. William, she had her reasons to withhold her alibi. She won't tell you, and she won't tell the inspector, but she did tell me, and I confirmed her claims are legitimate. Uh, I can't just take your word for it. Well, I understand. But know this, if you continue to view her as a suspect, you're wasting your time. Sir? Perfect timing, George. I think I've discovered a way to read the hidden ink message. But we may not need it, sir. I think I know who the killer is. Look at this. Liquor, lime, and a trace of egg white. Sniff. Del wit. Peace go sour. Sir, this must have been what Pope was holding when Kipling threw the drink on him. That would explain the strange pattern Mrs. Hart mentioned. George, where did you get this? Sir, my number one fan, Norman Bean. I met Alfred Pope before the party. He was the only one that would talk to me. I managed to slip him my story. He said that he would read it right away. Anticipation's killing me. So you weren't sneaking into that party to give out your story. You were trying to get it back. I wanted to see his thoughts, sir. You expected a response that quickly? It's a really good story. At any rate, you lied about not being able to get into the party. Not entirely. The back exit was indeed locked at 10. I neglected to add that I had come back once more to see that it was open. What time was this? Around 1.30, somebody had opened the deadbolt and kept the door ajar to prevent it from locking. I couldn't believe my luck. What did you do then? I was elated to find that not only was Alfred there, but that he was alone. So I, I mustered up the courage to ask him what he thought about my story. He didn't like it. He read it aloud, laughing at all the serious parts, mocking my superhuman Xantar character, who I was dumb enough to think was destined for greatness. So you killed him? No. You were hurt, humiliated? It would have been understandable under the circumstances? I didn't kill him. What did you do then? I wanted so much to just give him a piece of my mind. 
but I just snatched my story back and went out the same door that I came in. That's it? Yeah. You expect me to believe that you broke into the party, found the victim alone, had a humiliating altercation with him, and then simply left without a single guest as a witness. I know it seems a little far-fetched, but that's exactly what happened. Allow me to counter with an alternate story. One where a man ingratiated himself with my best constable in order to get close to a case because he had murdered a man out of fury and shame. No. I'm sorry, Mr. Bean, but the evidence strongly suggests that you are guilty of murder. Well, we finally got our man. He was playing you all along, Buglugs. Sir, I feel quite the fool. There was absolutely nothing murderous I saw in Norman Bean. Flattery is a powerful tool in the devil's arsenal. Somewhat ironic, isn't it, sirs? Alfred Pope's death will surely cause a surge in his book sales. Hmm, Mr. Pope will finally achieve the success that has thus far eluded him. Perhaps not so ironic after all. Aloha. Aloha, meine Schnecke? What the bloody hell does that mean? We had just booked a trip to Hawaii. Couldn't have conceived of a more delicious ending. He wrote it himself. means Mr. Pope went to extreme measures to cement his legacy. <sighs> Aloha, meine Schnecke. Both hello and goodbye, as I understand it. He was making apparent his suicide to you and to the world in order to generate sales. But Alfred never cared about sales. It doesn't make any sense. Well, perhaps it was just to you, meine Schnecke. His pet name for me. The German word for slug. He knew how much I hated that word. He used to tease me with it all the time. It always made me laugh. Somehow it's not working this time. Your husband found the most succinct way possible to tell you that he loved you. Did he not understand that I would rather we be free together? Thank you for your husband's work in progress. I can see by the notes in the margins that they match his handwritten notes. He was always editing in the margins with his stupid red pen. I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Pope. I do hope that you can find some peace. I'm not sure I know how without Alfred. Keep the change. Thank you very much. Thanks. It's nice having a bill paid for a change. Like some people. Oh. There you are. Thanks. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. True words were never spoken, if I may say so myself. I don't disagree. I think it's one of your most brilliant pieces. And hot off the presses, too. If, by committing my new poem, if, to memory, you're trying to grovel back an autograph. It's working. I don't grovel. I'm here to tell you that the man of virtue described in your poem is not the man that sits before me. And I'd sooner have the bartender's autograph than yours. Oh, and uh, I picked up your tab so you don't stiff him again. Men of virtue pay their bills, sir. Son of a gun. Who works? I cannot believe it. Uh, 
So it was a suicide all along? Yes. The answer was right under our noses the whole time. This was a, a plot development I never saw coming. Which just goes to show you I'm not much of a copper. Or a writer, for that matter. Now, on that matter, I'm not so sure. I read your story, Norman. It's so full of action and heart and valor. I found it nothing short of remarkable. Are you having me on? Not at all. I wouldn't change a single word. I do think you should try a pseudonym, however. Something a little snappier than Norman Bean. Norman Bean is a pseudonym, sir. I didn't want to risk embarrassing my family in case my book was a failure. Well, what's your real name? Burroughs. My name's Ed Burroughs. Ed Burroughs, that's not bad. It could use a little souping up. My proper name is Edgar Rice Burroughs. I would go with that. That has some real gravitas to it. I also think you should consider changing the name of your hero. Xantar sounds a bit like a magician. I also considered Tublet Zan. That sounds too much like a creature from outer space. It's not quite right for a, a superhuman man-ape character. What would you call him? Well, I would reverse it. Uh, Ape Man? No, I mean Xantar. I would reverse that. Tarzan. Yes. Actually, I was thinking Zartan, but Tarzan could work. Tarzan the Ape Man. <laughs> there we go. Here, let me buy you a pint. I owe you that much at least. I finally get to draw on your wisdom. I have a feeling I'll be drawing on yours, sir. Murdoch, a moment. If you've got any of your adhesive thingamajiggy and could stick this lot back together. It's a lost cause, isn't it? I'm afraid so. Mm. Oh, but be happy with what you have. You have some big names here. Including Alfred Pope, who I think will be worth more than the others since it's his final signature. Especially now that Killian's Folly is set to become such a big hit. <laughs> is this it here? Yes, why? You saw him sign it himself? I saw him do it with my own eyes. <sighs> That's different. What do you mean? <sighs> In Alfred's final aloha to his wife, the A was written by someone else. But that's impossible. Unless... pages matched the notes in your husband's manuscript. What I failed to identify was who wrote them. I trust you know the direction I'm heading in? I haven't the foggiest. They were both yours, Mrs. Pope. You were your husband's unofficial editor, the person behind the scenes who would do anything to ensure he got that bestseller. Is it against the law for a wife to help her husband? It's against the law to murder him. Were you tired of living in his shadow? My husband was too flimsy to cast a shadow. A shadow implies mass. Yet you made it seem as though his obscurity was a virtue. And that the respect of his peers was all he needed. For him, maybe. But what about me? I did half the work. Do you know how many hours I spent sculpting his words just so he, so we, could finally have one bestseller? So it was about money. It was about pride. Killian's folly had hit written all over it, and he refused to do the legwork. He was a serial self-sabotager, missing meetings, making drunken scenes, insulting publishers. He felt that made him a real artist. You saw things differently. He promised me trips. Spain, Ireland, and yes, Hawaii. 
He wintered on Arthur Conan Doyle's yacht. While I stayed home, and ate tinned ham and day-old bread, what would have made it easier was to have one bestseller. Just one. I needed that detective. I needed that at any cost. Man is most dangerous when he's broken, for he has nothing, nothing left to lose. You did read my book. Of course I did, fathead. Twice. It's really good, George. I was sure you didn't remember me. Well, you're cute, but not that bright. You didn't pick up on my signals about my fiancé, Ewan. Ah. Uh. He's the minister. Mm-hmm. He's not quite comfortable with my previous dalliances. I didn't want him to know that. I think of you, though, often. I think of you, too. I heard you got married. I did. Her name is Effie. You'd like her. You'd like Ewan, too. Perhaps one day we can all get together. Your book is a cracking good read, by the way. You read Anne of Green Gables? It is, of course. It's lovely. <laughs> the, the imagery is so picturesque, so moving. It should be a moving picture. No, a series of moving pictures. Uh, several incarnations that win the hearts of Canadians from coast to coast. <laughs> well, I've always loved your wild imagination, George. You take care of yourself. And Effie, too. You, too, Simone. At this rate, we're gonna run out of liquor. I'm glad tonight is profitable. Violet, you've had a long face all night. Do you not like the show? I'm just not in the mood for a party. Well, the rest of Toronto is. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for, the one, the only, Nina Bloom! <laughs> Are we having fun tonight, Toronto? Right. It's all right. I've got it. Carry on. Are you alright? <clears throat> Hit it, boys. That's enough complaining. When I was your age, I was at work before daybreak. All you two have to do is get yourselves to school on time. <laughs> I spoke to the woman who found him. She said there was no one else around. Very good, George. I can't believe somebody just left him like that. Dead? Naked. I mean, presumably they were after his wallet, but why take all of his clothes? But George, he was tied to a pole, stripped naked and killed. I doubt very much this was just about his wallet. I would estimate some time in the last three to seven hours. He appears to have been stabbed. Indeed. A puncture wound of a small circumference, close to the heart. Any other wounds? He has abrasions on his wrist from where he was tied to the lamp. I think he struggled for some time before he died. That's all I can tell you for now. Very good, Mrs. Hart. 
Miss Hamilton, we've not seen you for a while. It's Mrs. Reddick now. This is my husband. How do you do? Inspector, I've just seen advertisements for a burlesque show that's to be staged in Toronto. You don't say. I want to know what you and your men are going to do about it. Honestly? There's not much I can do about it, Mrs. Reddick. But the burlesque is an absolute disgrace. You may recall I visited this station house before to complain about these types of shows. How could I forget? Our cause has been joined by Mr. Glover. I can see why Mr. Reddick is here. What's your excuse? Well, I have recently moved to Toronto, hoping it would be a bastion of morality. Oh, have you now? Well, welcome to Toronto. An excellent city where burlesque dancing is perfectly legal. Higgins, what are you doing? Giving Miss Bloom's show some free advertising. Your former lady love is causing quite the stir. Is that right? I've just had some do-gooders rabbiting on at me. They want me to shut down her show. But, sir, I haven't seen it yet. Yes, well, these types are best left ignored. Have you seen Miss Bloom's show yet, Crabtree? No, I haven't, sir. I'm a married man. And Miss Bloom is a former paramour. Too much temptation? Hardly seems appropriate. Well, it doesn't stop the inspector. Watch it, Higgins. Excuse me. Can you help? I'm looking for my husband. How long has your husband been missing? Only a day, but I'm embarrassed to say he may be in your cells for public intoxication. Ah, uh, what's his name? Richard Hadley. Could you describe him to us? He was wearing a brown tweed suit with a red tie and a blue striped shirt, clean shaven, brown hair, spectacles. Large mole on his left thigh? Yes, why? Richard, what happened to him? He was found this morning. He had been stabbed. Who would do that to him? Was he robbed? Yes, ma'am. Of his clothes, even. He was naked. Mrs. Hadley, where was your husband last night? He always goes bowling on Thursdays at the YMCA with some men from work. Detective, a word. Please excuse me, Mrs. Hadley. Uh, take all the time you need. Sure. Mr. Hadley had a great deal of alcohol in his stomach. The YMCA doesn't serve liquor. Well, cause of death was a single stab wound directly to the heart. He would have died in minutes. Uh, I found this in the pulmonary valve. It's gold and has a point at the end. Curious weapon. I'd guess it's half of a hat pin. Oh, very good. One more thing. A stab directly to the heart is somewhat unusual. The heart is difficult to reach. The killer would have had to puncture the skin on the left between the third and fourth rib and then directed the weapon towards the right. So the killer had to have knowledge of human anatomy. Or got very lucky. Does Effie know that Nina is back in town? Higgins, I'm trying to tell you about our honeymoon. Yes, but does she? Oh, I don't know. I certainly haven't told her. Perhaps she's seen a poster. Well, now that we're practically brothers, I feel I have to say, I don't think you should see Nina. Higgins, I wasn't planning. Look at this chap. What did Miss Headley say? Uh, a tweed suit, striped shirt, red tie? Red tie. Excuse me, sir. Up there. Are those your clothes? They're mine, fair and square. Well, that's a strange thing to say. Where did you get them? I'm not telling. I believe these clothes belong to a man who was murdered last night. Oh. <laughs> I don't know anything about any murdered man. But, but I'm keeping the suit. Turn out your pockets, please, sir. There's nothing in the pockets. Definitely no money. Worst luck. <laughs> it was just this. The Cerebrite Club. 
True. Tied naked to a post. What a way to go. Indeed. And how did he end up like that after a night of bowling? Sir, I telephoned the YMCA. The bowling alley has been closed for a month, undergoing renovations. So Hadley lied to his wife. His wages were burning a hole in his pocket, and he wanted a drink. Yes, or it's possible he never told his wife he was going bowling at all. Do you think she's lying to you? It's possible. Why would she do that? I shall endeavor to find out. Huh. His name was Richard Hadley? I'm sorry, there were a lot of men in here last night. Well, he was uh, clean-shaven, spectacles, blue-striped shirt, red tie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I remember him now. He slapped his wage packet on the bar and spent every penny. <laughs> Something about this chap you found quite funny. It depends on what you find funny. That man was enjoying himself, spending a lot of money when a woman came in looking for him. I assumed it was his wife. What makes you say that? Oh, I know an angry wife when I see one. She asked for his wages. When he said they were gone, she gave him quite a smack. Really? <laughs> and did they leave together? She marched out right after. He stayed a while. Hmm. George? Nina! <laughs> you didn't come to my show last night. Well, I, I, I wasn't sure. I didn't know you were in town. Well, you must have seen the posters. Well, never mind. You're here now. You are looking fabulous, George. You haven't aged a day. You know, it was really sweet of you to come see me. Well, as a matter of fact, I, I happen to be here on police business. Oh, so you didn't come see me at all? Well, it, it wasn't that I didn't want to come see you. I was, I'm not sure how to behave or, or how to be in terms of you and me, because I'm, you know, I'm recently married. Mm. And? And I wasn't sure if it was appropriate to come see somebody who's a former, you know, and also happens to be a, you know. Do you know? I don't know. George, we're friends. Of course, of course, yes. Then you're coming to our next show. Yes. And you're bringing your wife. No. I will not take no for an answer. Oh, Nina. Don't worry, she'll have the best of care. Mm. If you want. So, how is life as a working mother? Uh, busy, but happy. Good. Honestly, there's so much going on around here, I'm not sure how we'd cope without you. Mm. Oh, I beg your pardon. Can you help me, please? Y yes. What can we do for you, Mrs. Parsons? I wasn't feeling like myself this morning. My neighbor said I should go. Oh, Mrs. Parsons, you all right? I think I'm going to faint. Kate, fetch some water and let's get you through to the examination room. She slapped her husband right there in the Starbright Club? According to Miss Bright. But she lied to us. And where is this man who was wearing the victim's clothing? Uh, Higgins had him wait in your office. Very good. Uh, sir, one other thing. Have you and the doctor ever attended the burlesque? No, no. Although we did attend a performance of the Jubilee Singers once that turned remarkably racy. Right, it's just that Nina Bloom is in town and she wants to meet Effie and she's invited us to the show and there's so many elements I find awkward and inappropriate about it. I, I haven't the foggiest idea what to do. My advice would be to seek counsel from someone else, Georgia. Shall we? All this fuss over some clothes. I found them. They're mine. The man who owns those clothes was killed last night, Mr. Trombey. Well, I like the suit. I wouldn't kill for it. Mr. Trombey, I'd like to know where you found these clothes. Uh, I was sitting on a bench uh, near the Clarence Avenue Bridge, and I saw a woman toss a pile of clothes over onto the tracks. So I went down and, and got them. Oh. Fits pretty good. Can you describe this woman? Uh, slight, blonde hair. That fits Mrs. Adley. So she lied to us. 
she slapped her husband and threw his clothes off a bridge. Bring her in, George. Sir. Mrs. Hadley, I understand you just lost your husband, but you did lie to us. I was embarrassed. I thought he had drank so much that he got locked up. That's why I came here. But I didn't want to say where he was drinking. So you knew where he went last night? Yes. You went into the club and you confronted your husband? We're just scraping by. I couldn't believe that he would be out buying expensive drinks when we needed that money. What happened after the argument? I went home. And when I woke up, I realized he hadn't come back. And then work called saying he hadn't arrived for his shift. Was anyone with you? Did anyone see you go home? No, I, I don't think so. I have a witness who saw a woman throw your husband's clothes off a bridge. A woman bearing your description. I don't know anything about that. You have to believe me. Oh, George. Not now, Higgins. Well, you don't know what I was going to say. If it's about Nina, I don't want to hear it. It's actually about the murder, but if you don't want to hear it... Well, what is it, then? I was just speaking to Stephen at the water cooler. This better be going somewhere. He just took a trip to Buffalo, and he told me that while he was there, he read a very interesting article in the newspaper. And? Well, a man was stripped naked and tied to a lamppost. Really? Was he murdered? No, but the man refused to say who did it to him. It's strange, don't you think? Indeed. When was this? Two weeks ago. Wait, then, Higgins, see if you can find other instances of this happening in other cities. Well, how will I do that? What? Telephone the newspapers. It's not the type of story they're likely to forget. Well, aren't you going to help? I'll help as soon as I'm back. I've got to go talk to Effie. Mr. Duncan, to what do we owe the pleasure? Gives me no pleasure to say what I have to say to you, Tom. Oh, please have a seat. Uh, I've just had Mrs. Reddick down at the Board of Control, along with her husband. Though she did all the talking. Yes, I've met her several times. She's furious about this burlesque review. She's always complained about anything to do with liquor or dancing. I told her today, as I've told her before, it's all perfectly legal and I won't be putting a stop to it. You can, and you will. Mrs. Reddick said she will not rest until these dancers are made to stop, and she means it. What does it matter? Let her complain all she wants. She holds great sway in the temperance movement, and I can't afford to get on their bad side. Shut it down, Tom. <sighs> Mrs. Parsons, your blood pressure is very low. Is that bad? <sighs> it's likely why you almost fainted. We'll have to ascertain the cause. Your heartbeat is accelerated. I'm just not going back to the hospital. You were in the hospital recently? Yes, two weeks ago. They were horrible to me. What were you in the hospital for? What they call a tubal ligation. That's a major surgery. Have you been resting since? How can I? I have to work, raise my children. My husband didn't want me getting it done, but I told him I'd get the surgery and he wouldn't even notice. <sighs> oh. uh. Mrs. Parsons, you're likely suffering complications from the surgery. It could be internal bleeding. Nurse Sullivan! <sighs> this woman needs surgery immediately. Help me prepare the room. But we can't. There's no time. Now, Kate! <sighs> so... Let me get this straight. Nina Bloom has invited us to watch her remove her clothes. Well, not all of her clothes. Some of her clothes. Some of her, most of her clothes. And you think this is a good idea? I think it's about the most uncomfortable situation I can imagine. But I didn't want to pretend the whole thing didn't happen and... And? And in an ideal world, I would like to remain a friend of hers and this is the way she suggested we proceed. Well. I hardly mind either way. Really? Question is, what would you like to do? Yes. <laughs> Avoid the situation entirely. Right. Nina, there he is. Something that appears not to be possible. 
Why, George Crabtree, oh. we meet again. Uh, here we are, yes. <laughs> uh, Nina, I'm lovely to see you. This is Effie, Effie Crabtree, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. I've heard so much about you. Hello, Mrs. Crabtree. Nina, your former flame is married. <laughs> I would like to introduce you both to the outspoken Randy Potts, Edie Sweet, mm -hmm. and the Scarlet Blaze, mm. all part of Nina Bloom's Burlesque Spectacular. Wow. Lovely to meet you all. What's it like knowing your husband courted the Nina Bloom? It's fine. You're not the least bit jealous. <laughs> Why would I be? If George Crabtree is the prize, then... I'm the winner. <laughs> <laughs> I like her. Well, then it's settled. You're coming to the show. W well, we'd, we'd love to. <laughs> I'm so pleased. Until then. Yeah. Ladies. <laughs> yes, I told the constable that I remembered that man. Did you see him leave the club? I saw his wife leave right after they fought. But what about him uh, or anyone else that was with him? No. Sorry, detective. Thank you, Miss Bright. You could ask the man that's been here harassing me and my patrons. He was here again last night. Who's this? I don't know his name, but he moved into that building across the street. Who? Oh. Detective, you could also tell him to leave me and my club alone. Detective Murdoch, Toronto Constabulary. Oh. Yes, I spoke with your inspector. Are you here to shut down that establishment across the street? Um, I'd like to ask you if you saw a man leave the club last night between 1 and 2 a.m. Many men come and go from that place. Absolute wastrels. Chicago was bad enough. I thought this was Toronto the good. Uh, this particular man wore spectacles, had a red tie, brown tweed suit. He was likely inebriated. I did see a man like that, as a matter of fact. He came out of the club and he went that way. Uh, he was with a woman, tall, red hair. They went into those lodgings there, at the end of the street. Are, are you quite sure? The man I'm referring to was found this morning, having gone entirely the opposite direction. Oh, I'm sure. See two torn stitches causing internal bleeding. Our pressure's still very low. I'm repairing the stitches now. This is irresponsible, Julia. We're not equipped for surgery. We had no choice. We should have taken her to the hospital. There was no time. And if we fail... We won't. Detective Murdoch, how are you? Miss Bloom, hello. My burlesque troupe is in Toronto. You should come see a show. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Miss Bloom, I'm conducting a murder investigation. And uh, how do I put this delicately? No need to be delicate around us, Detective. <laughs> uh, did you or any of your friends bring a man back here last night? Not a real man. Randy. No, not any kind of man. We left the club together a little after 1 a.m. I spoke with a witness who says he saw the victim with a red-haired woman. Surely I'm not the only woman with red hair in Toronto. I I'm sorry we can't be more help, Detective. We have to get ready for our show tonight. Of course. Okay. Thank you. San Francisco, Chicago, Buffalo have all had reports of men being stripped and tied to lampposts. Detroit as well. Detroit, and of course, Toronto. Do you think it's the same person? Well, it's hard to say. None of the men will admit who tied them to the lampposts. If it is the same person, why did they kill in Toronto? If it was the same person, perhaps this time they just went too far. You become a sequential killer. Or she. Remember, it was a gold hat pin that was used as a murder weapon. Were the men all embarrassed that a woman overcame them and tied them up? That could be the case. 
Although I've known some particularly strong women in my time. You certainly have. Higgins, wait a minute. Give me that. Uh, read out the, the dates of the incidents. Uh, Buffalo, April 18th. Columbus, April 25th. Chicago, May 6th. Toronto, May... Higgins? We need to find the detective. Miss Bloom, what can you tell me about the night of the murder? Because at the moment, all of the evidence points towards you and your friends. I don't know what you're talking about. I can tie your burlesque troupe to a string of incidents where men were stripped naked and tied up. We didn't have anything to do with the murder. I swear on my life. But did you know this man? After our shows, if there's a fellow who's a little too friendly, one of us pretends to be drunk. And then what? She takes him home. The other women follow. If he just takes her to her door and leaves, he's a gentleman. And if he doesn't just leave? We take him out to the street corner, force him to undress, and leave him tied to a lamppost. Mr. Hadley was one of these men. And Miss Blaze left the club with him. And Randy Potts threw his clothes over the bridge. <sighs> Mr. Hadley could have overpowered any one of you. I have a prop gun for our cops and robbers routine. I, I used it just to scare him a little. It doesn't work. You can see for yourself. It's back in my room. Miss Blue, Mr. Hadley wasn't shot. He was stabbed through the heart with a hat pin. I, I don't know anything about that. We never hurt anyone. We just... We just want to embarrass them. Make them think twice before ever being aggressive with a lady. George, can we talk? Constable? Is there anything you forgot to tell the detective this time? Oh, I just wanted to apologize. I'm sorry I didn't tell you how we were involved sooner. We really should have, Nina. I'm sure you know that this makes you and your friends look guilty. But I swear to you, we didn't hurt him. He was trying to hurt one of us. George, you don't know what it's like to always be on your guard, to know that any evening some man... I could... appreciate that, Nina. But what you and your friends were doing, you were playing a very dangerous game. I know. But George... Please stand up for us. You know me. You know I could never be involved in a murder. Right now I have to make sure that you're in the cells. I'm sorry. I believe her, sir. She had nothing to do with this. Sounds like she was involved. She admitted as much. Well, they tied the man to a lamppost to humiliate him, that's all. That makes them all suspects. Yes, but anything would have happened after they left him there. Sir, you both know Nina Bloom well. Do you honestly think she's capable of killing a man? Things could have changed since we last saw Miss Bloom Crabtree. The life of a traveling burlesque dancer could make a woman... Into a murderer? Into someone who might go to extremes to protect herself. Mrs. Parsons, did you sleep well? I don't know, I think so. We had to operate to stop the internal bleeding. You, you saved me, Doctor. Yes, but we're not equipped to perform surgeries here. You should have gone back to the hospital. At the hospital, they just poked and prodded me like I was a slab of meat on the table. They didn't listen to anything I said. I'm never going back there. You could have died. But I didn't. Thanks to you. Cheers. Miss Bloom and her dancers are in jail. Until we get to the bottom of what happened, the show's cancelled. Those protesters got their wish. Maybe now they'll leave me alone. You ought to count yourself lucky. They went to the Board of Control. They want me to shut this place down. Shut me down? I should be the one bringing charges against them. What for? They threw a smoke bomb on my stage. Why didn't you come to the station house and file a report? 
What's the point? And I didn't see who did it. Are you going to shut me down? I'd rather not. But if the board wants you out of business, they'll find a way. You wouldn't still have that smoke bomb, would you? Yes, I think so. Why? All right, George. Miss Bloom said the gun was in a box near the door. Sir, it's frosted through. Completely seized. Very good, George. We'll bring that with us. Sir, I can't imagine we'll find much else of use in here. I feel like we should be out looking for the real killer. I know you want to believe Miss Bloom, George, but let's keep looking. What exactly are we looking for? We'll know when we find it. Oh, no. Sir. What is it, George? The other half of the hat pen. Missing piece for the murder weapon. you up. I trust Mr. Duncan from the Board of Control has seen you. Indeed he has. Then you'll shut down that immoral nightclub immediately. Their show has been cancelled. But don't gloat. It's nothing you did. It's due to circumstances beyond your control. All the same, it's a small step in the right direction. What did I say when I saw you last? <laughs> that the uh, burlesque show was legal, which I find hard to believe. I said I would look into the matter. But when I did, I found this. This was thrown onto the stage at the Starbright Club. Now I'm willing to bet one of you did it. We would never. Well, then you won't mind giving me your finger marks to compare. Or I'll dispose of this if you lot get out of my station house for good. Clear? You've just made an enemy of Mr. Duncan, Inspector. Ronald? Scarlet Blaze, is that your real name? It's been my name so long, I forget any other. And this is the truth, Miss Potts. Constables, are these women dancers with that licentious review? <laughs> In the flesh. Are you both being arrested for immorality? Oh, and we're all in here accused of murder, but... They've got nothing on any of us that is stay. Miss Potts, please. Will you speak to all the women again, sir? They all covered for each other, and I fear they would do the same again, and we'd be no further ahead in discovering who killed Mr. Hadley. Well, if you don't mind, sir, perhaps I'll call Effie. Maybe she can help them. Oh, yes, George. If they won't confess anything further, then I'm afraid I can't help them. They'll all go to trial. Where did this photograph come from? I suppose Higgins may have found it looking into the lady's tour. George? Have a look at that. The hat pin? The murder weapon. It's identical. And it's worn by one Edie Sweet. I swear to you, I lost that hat pin in Chicago. I was frantic. It's the most expensive thing anyone ever gave me. If you lost it, how did half of it end up in Mr. Hadley's chest and the other half hidden in your room? I'm telling you, I don't know. You stabbed Mr. Hadley with such force, the hat pin broke in half. You then pulled the jeweled half out of his chest, hid it in your room, likely to pawn later. No. I did keep it, but I didn't stab him. I went back after we had all left him. You and your friends left Mr. Hadley there, and he was alive. You then came back alone and found him dead. Why did you go back to him? I 
don't want to say. Miss Sweet, you are likely going to hang for murder. Your cooperation right now may be the only thing that saves you. I wanted an apology. For him trying to force himself on your friend. No, not that. You knew him. Years ago. We used to be together. He beat me. He stole from me. He was horrible. That's why you all targeted him. It always feels good to give those men what's coming to them. But with him, I wanted more. I wanted to see his humiliation just a little bit longer. Miss Sweet, this all sounds like very strong motive for murder. But I didn't kill him. He was dead. I saw the hat pin. I panicked and I took it. Mrs. Crabtree, thank you for coming. Of course. I'm sorry our second meeting is under much less enjoyable circumstances. Do you think you can get me out of here? Well, there's an awful lot of evidence against you. I just don't understand what happened. When we left him, he was alive. And then when I went back, he was dead. I... Your former lover killed with your hat pin. Yes. How do you suppose it got there? I don't know. Was it one of your friends? No. Why would they? Miss Sweet, it's very difficult to understand how anyone but you could be responsible. Do you think I did it? I think that a jury will believe you did it. Oh, Henry. Good detective work today. That photograph was very useful. Uh, what photograph, sir? The one you left on my desk of the burlesque dancers. I'm sorry, sir. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh. Right, Henry. Gather all of the information you have on the men who were tied to lampposts. Give it all to George and have him meet me in my office straight away. Sir, I have those articles. Ah, yes. Were you able to find anything pertaining to the Chicago incident? I did, sir. And that was the blessed troops last stop before coming to Toronto just last week. Right then, listen to this. A man was found this morning tied to a lamppost on the corner of Fairview and Carfax Avenue. He identified himself as Dr. Sullivan Reed of Nethridge Drive. Dr. Reed refused to say how he found himself in the predicament or who put him there. He also refused to comment on the fact that he was absent a stitch of clothing. Miss Sweet maintains that she lost the hat pin in Chicago and then it turned up here in Toronto as a murder weapon. But, sir, she had a prior relationship with Hadley. She hated him. That could be a terrible coincidence. So how does this Dr. Reed from Chicago figure into the murder? He could have taken the hat pin, kept it with him, traveled to Toronto following the tour dates of the burlesque troupe. It wouldn't have been difficult. And waited for them to find their next man. There's no picture of him. How will we know who he is? Chicago. I believe we've met him, George, several times. Chicago was bad enough. I thought this was Toronto the good. Mr. Glover knew that we had all the women in custody. We're only here accused of murder, but they've got nothing on any of us that is stick. Sir, he could have been the one who put that photograph of Miss Sweet on your desk. He's the one who pointed me in the direction of the women's lodgings. And as he's a doctor, he would know how to stab a man through the heart. Release the women, George. The show must go on. Good people of Toronto! Turn away from this den of iniquity! Shameful degenerates have no place in our town! Mrs. Reddick, Mrs. Reddick, what are you doing? We are trying to make the citizens... Dear, please. We are doing work that you and your men should be doing, Detective. We were told the show tonight was cancelled, but evidently not. So you're teaching these people a lesson? Precisely. Is that what you were doing, Dr. Reed? Yes, of course. We must... I'm sorry, he's running! Oh. 
Dr. Reed, you're under arrest. On your feet. They did it to me, all right. All I was trying to do was help one of those ladies back to her hotel. Are you sure that's all you were doing? They tied me up. They took my clothes, and they left me there all night. I was the laughing stock of Chicago. I lost my practice, my wife, everything. So you took Miss Sweet's hat pin that night in Chicago and kept it with you? I knew I could use it to get revenge on at least one of those harlots. And what better way to do it than stab it through the heart of another poor schmuck who they were going to destroy? You killed an innocent man to get your revenge. Innocent? He was at a burlesque, pawing women and drinking his life away. Pathetic. Just like me. She went to sleep so quickly. Evidently, so did you. Mm. Ellie is a firm believer in baby airing. <laughs> Exposing her to as much fresh air as possible. I think it tires her out. How was your day? Oh, fine. A young lady was being framed for murder, and we managed to uncover her innocence. Wonderful. And uh, how is your patient faring? Did she fully recover after the emergency surgery? Just. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. But you're not happy? It's the clinic. It's too small. We can't serve the needs of the women of Toronto. You want to expand? More than that. Toronto needs a women's hospital. And the women's clinic will be the foundation on which it is built. Effie, are you sure about this? I mean, we're leaving in the morning to go on our honeymoon. Well, we'll have to have hangovers on the train. Mr. Duncan, fancy meeting you here. Tom. Uh, yes, I, uh, thought I should see the show for myself to know what I'm fighting against. Indeed. I reckon you should be thanking me for letting the show go on. Now, Tom, let's not argue. How about you never ask me to close down a burlesque again, and I'll never tell anyone you were here. Enjoy your evening. <laughs> George. Okay. Oh, Oh, how marvelous. Nina, you look wonderful. You're a doll. Uh, George, can we talk for a minute? I'll go find us a table. It's all right, Nina, I understand. Of course, you'd be sweet about it. It's just like you, but I just want you to know how sorry I am for lying to you. You were protecting your friend. Had to. Four of us. All we have is each other. Are you all right, Nina? I mean, really. I have to admit, seeing you so happy, it's hard not to think of the path not taken. But this is the life I chose, and... Let's go! I wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's gonna be a bad day. Yeah, I'm tired of shit, and the coffee ain't hit yet, damn, ain't that great nice. I don't wanna go to work, cause my boss is a jerk, and I'm not even that paid so I need a change in my life, cause I don't feel alive, and there's nothing that makes me happy Oh, Hold my beer for a minute, I'm about to quit my job, cash in for a ticket I'm going on a trip, and I don't plan to visit I'm gonna stay there till I feel like I'm winning, oh And this is just the beginning, I need a big change, help me feel like living I need a big swing, home runs, I'm hit Wherever is he? I want to put my eyes on that machine of his. 
the infamous falcon. Well, that blasted thing has taken him so long, it better have wings. If you want wings, go play with Aubrey Welford Crossley and his flying machine. Really? Ah, Dee Dee. Dee Dee, where's your husband? We want to see this motorcycle already. Patience, gentlemen. The Falcon will be worth the wait. Whoa, oh, there it is. We're going to tell you. Let's go. Let's go see what he can do. I received a letter from Harry this morning. Oh, and how is he faring at boarding school? Quite well, according to him. The accompanying letter from his mother says that he was almost expelled for sneaking out to see girls. Oh. I love Mario like his father. <laughs> Did we forget the melon? No, no. It's right here in the icebox. Where did he go? I haven't the foggiest. Look. Ellsworth? Ellie? No. It can't be. Dear God. He's dead. Oh. He must have gone straight off the cliff. Well, it's sooner than I would have hoped, but Susanna was bound to see her dead body eventually. Well, Mrs. Hart will have her work cut out for her. Significant injuries to the body. Yes, it's almost as if he fell off a cliff. His motorcycle's in shambles. It's a horrific accident. I wonder what happened. I suppose we'll have to chat with his compatriots. Ellsworth Drummond. The man was a legend. In what sense? In every sense. He locked himself in his garage building that motorcycle these last two years. A recluse. And a genius. How did you know him? We know his wife. She's a member of our motoring club. We toured about in our motorcycles. Where do you go? We don't go anywhere per se. We just go. For fun. Today, mind you, was a special occasion. Dee Dee called us round to see the Falcon. Falcon? The motorcycle her husband's been working on. It was finally ready for its first demonstration run. Well, alas, ready it was not. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. His wife's overcome. Her husband rode his motorcycle off of a cliff. There were no signs of braking or swerving. I think he did it intentionally. Certainly a unique way to take one's life. Did she say anything that would indicate he intended to do something like this? Not at all. It was his great unveiling, the best day of his life, she said. So he rode off the side of the cliff? Yes. And I need to determine if it was rider error or a failing of the motorcycle itself. Like the brakes not working. Door being tampered with. Bloody nuisance, these. Too loud. Even with these new exhaust mufflers. I don't know, Inspector. I like them. And rather fast. Oh, no. What? Julia, you aren't thinking of riding a motorcycle. Not very ladylike, Doctor. Are you two telling me what to do? Damn right we are. 
No, 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 no. It's just they are very dangerous. Our current case proves that. Well, yes, if you ride them off a cliff. So what about the brakes? Unfortunately, the damage is significant, and there are mechanisms that I'm not familiar with. Well, by all accounts, it's a revolutionary design. Which I need to learn more about. My husband had been working on the Falcon for years. It was perfect. He was sure of it. Who besides Mr. Drummond knew of the Falcon's designs? Well, there was an article about it in Popular Mechanics. Oh, what did the article say? It was only a photograph and an announcement. Ellsworth wouldn't let the writer so much as lay eyes on the Falcon. He was so careful about his designs being stolen. Mm. Well, surely he trusted you with his secrets? Uh, he trusted me, yes. But I'm hardly a motorcycle builder. I know nothing about the Falcon's designs. His motorcycle was everything to him. It was his whole world, and now. <laughs> yes, I'm terribly sorry for your loss. Thank you. With your permission, I would like to have a look in his workshop. Of course. What are you hoping to find? Parts, drawings, anything that will help me understand how the motorcycle worked in the hopes of understanding what may have gone wrong. When did this happen, Mrs. Drummond? I haven't the slightest. This blood appears to be fresh. It seems as though someone has broken in. We should have called before we came. And have him duck us again? It's only polite. Oh, Hardy, you're such a oh. bore. <laughs> you there, are you Ellsworth Drummond? I am not. <laughs> you see, this is why we don't call. The man tries to duck us again. Now, look here, Drummond. Billy, look at this. An injection line behind the intake. <sighs> Mamma mia. You're a clever sword, aren't you, Drummond? But who cares about this anyway? Where's the Falcon? Gentlemen, I, I truly am not Mr. Drummond. This morning, both he and the Falcon met their unfortunate end at the bottom of a cliff. He rode it off a cliff? Oh, dear. Well, motorcycle man riding his own motorcycle off a cliff. We'd be lucky to die so poetically. Did the two of you know Mr. Drummond? It, only by reputation. And quite the reputation it was. We traveled all the way from Wisconsin just to meet the fella. They, anyhow, if you're not Drummond, then who are you? Detective William Murdoch, Toronto Constabulary. And you? Arthur Davidson. And William S. Harley. Mr. Davidson, Mr. Harley. Harley Davidson. Be <laughs> silent, stray fellow <laughs> fellows. That's right. It's... Quietest bike on the road. Bike? Oh, that's an amusing way to refer to a motorcycle. <laughs> bike. Sure thing. Anyhow, dead old Drummond here supposedly was running his Falcon up to 75 miles per hour, and we want to figure out how in the heck he did it. We can't seem to crack 60 on our V-twin. And anything bigger is too expensive or too bulky. So, where is it? <laughs> We sure would like a gander. I may be able to arrange that. <laughs> oh, oh. Why, it's beautiful. It's a mess. I need your help. I need to determine exactly what happened when Mr. Drummond and the Falcon went off of that cliff. What do you need from us? Well, I don't know enough about a motorcycle's inner workings to put it back together and discern what might have transpired. You need a, a doctor to do an autopsy on the motorcycle? Precisely. Now, my first suspicion, of course, is the brakes, but whether they failed outright or were tampered with... How dastardly. Say no more, detective. We're the men for the job. Henry, I need you to sort through these papers. What are they? Uh, well, some presumably are our plans and designs for a motorcycle called the Falcon. And the others are, well, meaningless scribblings and doodles. Uh, so you want me to look for the designs? 
Yes, I need you to sort them into piles, pertinent and non-pertinent. Uh, pertinent being any uh, uh, schematics and, and motorcycle-related drawings and such, and non-pertinent, everything else. All right. Oh, sir, I got a postcard from George. They're in London. Oh, he must be enjoying that tremendously. As is Effie. Does he say where they're off to next? Uh, oh, they're going to Bruges. What? Bruges. Bruges. What's Bruges? Bloody hell, Higgins. For once in your life, look at a map. It's in... Belgium. You don't pay me enough to travel, sir. You're not missing much. I wouldn't be seen dead in bloody Belgium. Murdoch, my office. Uh, sir. Murdoch, this is Mr... Vanderwick. Reginald Vanderwick. I'm here about the death of Ellsworth Drummond. I came as soon as I heard. What did you hear? Well, I telephoned Drummond to see how he fared after his morning test run. His wife answered and told me the dire news. What's your interest? He's the dead man's partner. Yes, I look after the financials of our endeavor. As you can understand, I'm beyond dismayed. I was set to make a mint once the Falcon was ready. Is that so? A mass production motorcycle that can hit 75 miles an hour on a standard B-twin. Our competition would have been ruined. Now I must start again. That's why I'm here. I understand you have the designs and the Falcon itself. The motorcycle is being examined as we speak. After all, it is evidence. Why is it being considered evidence? You don't suspect foul play, do you? Experts are examining the machine presently to determine just that. Experts? What experts? A Mr. Davidson and a Mr. Harley, uh, motorcycle builders. Motorcycle builders? No, no, you must put a stop to this at once. Our investigation requires... Your investigation does not encompass rival engineers examining patented designs. I will have my property returned to me forthwith, or I will see to it my lawyers sue the station house... Mr. Van Der have a seat. We will ensure that only members of my station house are looking at your motorcycle. Isn't that right, Murdoch? Yes, sir. Thank you. You don't have any scotch, do you? Excellent idea. Gentlemen, I'm afraid I lost the tech. There you are. Now, look here. The brakes. Not a thing wrong with them. Except they've been smashed to pieces along with everything else. No sign of tampering. Not at all. But there is something else. The accelerator. It, it's a simple design, but there's a, a rather ingenious little latch freshly welded on here. What does it do? Well, so far as I can tell, if the throttle were to reach a certain point, it would catch, bypassing the braking system and, and locking the accelerator. Locking the accelerator wide open? That's right. So the rider would not be able to slow down at all? It would keep him riding at full speed until, uh... Until he went flying over a dang cliff. Mamma mia. What? This latch, is it something simple? Well, the, the, the latch itself is simple, but to install something like this would require an intimate knowledge of uh, motorcycle mechanics. So whoever did this knew a lot about motorcycles. Thank you, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Oh, gentlemen, I'm afraid I must ask you to stop inspecting the Falcon at once. You think whoever meddled with the accelerator is one of this lot? Whoever it was had a detailed knowledge of motorcycle mechanisms. From what I understand, that's a very small community here in Toronto. I still can't believe he didn't so much as swerve. Maybe he was going so fast he lost control. And you two ride together? Julia? William, what are you doing here? Well, we're... What are you doing here? Oh, well, I'm considering buying a motorcycle. Are you sure that's wise? Oh, William, come on, it's just a bit of fun. Did you know that Mr. Coulter here is the fastest man in Canada? Is that so? I happen to hold the current record, yes. Uh, the Falcon smashed your record in its first test run. Unofficial? Not for long. No one even saw that test run. It's only a matter of time until you're completely forgotten, Coulter. Oh, sit down, Jock. Mr. Coulter, is it? Am I to understand that had the Falcon not met its end, you might have lost your national speed record? We'll never know. Of course he would have. 
Mr. Cole, can you please remove your glove? What's going on, William? Someone broke into Mr. Drummond's garage, and they cut themselves on some broken glass. That someone likely sabotaged the motorcycle, which led to his death. Sabotage? You can't think I had anything to do. Please remove your glove. You're coming with us, Sunshine. I'll see you at dinner. Yes. Hmm. I broke in. Yes. I cut my hand. Yes. But I didn't kill him. He was going to break your speed record. Supposedly. That's why you broke in. To sabotage the Falcon. I put sand in his gas tank. Yes. What? Why? To clog the intake. You wouldn't even be able to start the thing. You wanted to sabotage the prototype to preserve your speed record. I'm not proud of it. I don't have a wife. I don't have kids. I don't even have a job. But I am the fastest man in Canada. That's what I am. You're making our case for us. So why didn't it work, putting sand in the tank? By all accounts, the motorcycle was running in top form prior to the accident. Well, he must have heard me break the glass. I heard him coming towards the workshop and ran off. I imagine he flushed the engine. Or putting sand in the tank wasn't the only thing you did to the Falcon. Meaning what? Meaning you could also have installed a latch on the accelerator, which would have been just as effective in ending his demonstration run. Well, I suppose I could have, but I didn't. I would go to great lengths to keep my record, but I wouldn't kill a man. Do you believe it? Not particularly, but until we have more evidence, it's impossible to. Gentlemen. Who are you two? Oh, uh, William S. Hartley and Arthur Davidson, sir. Motorcycle builders. And what are you doing in my station house? Sir, these are the two young men who helped to identify what had been done to the Falcon's accelerator. They appear to be going through Mr. Drummond's papers. Uh, we just wanted to have a look. <laughs> you can't blame us for trying. When it comes to motorcycles, we really are bad boys. To <laughs> Wild ones, they call us. <laughs> now you've had a good shift, eh? Off you trot. Yeah. Yep. Higgins. What are you doing leaving these papers lying around? The detective told me to sort through them. And this is your sorting, is it? Ah, yes, I'm finished. <laughs> You're the one who told me to get a map. Henry. You've sorted this into three piles. Yes, sir. Pertinent, non-pertinent, and very non-pertinent. What's very non-pertinent? Uh, duplicates. There's a dozen copies of the same letter, sir. What's in the letter? I don't know. I was looking for designs and schematics, not reading. Oh. Oh, this is very good, Henry. <sighs> it's a letter from a lawyer accusing your husband of stealing the designs of the Falcon from another motorcycle manufacturer. Well, that's ridiculous. What manufacturer? The attorney does not disclose the identity of his client. However, he does demand that your husband cease all work on the Falcon effective immediately. This is the first I've heard of it. You should speak to his partner, Mr. Vanderwick. Yes, I've seen it. It's poppycock. You claim the designs for the Falcon were original. Of course. Drummond spent years building that machine. It's an incredible achievement. It was set to revolutionize the market. Whoever's behind this is simply jealous and afraid. So you were aware of the allegations? Yes. I responded to the first letter. What was your response? Poppycock. All subsequent letters were ignored. It was harassment, plain and simple. Harassment by whom? By Esterholt, of course. Who? Bertram Esterholt. Drummond's partner from years ago. Drummond strived for perfection, but Esther Holt liked to cut corners. The two of them had a falling out. He was left behind. I never said no letter. Then who did? How should I know? Where were you at 9 a.m. this morning? At home sleeping. Can anyone confirm this? I'm a bachelor. What's this all about, anyway? The fool wrote himself off a cliff, didn't he? 
We have reason to believe someone tampered with his motorcycle. Whoever it was had detailed knowledge of its inner workings. I haven't touched a motorcycle in two years. Hadn't heard from Drummond in that time either, till last night. You spoke to him last night? He phoned me to crow about the Falcon being ready. And his dream was made real. He even invited me to come see the demonstration run. I never should have had that telephone put in. It is nothing but a nuisance. Did you attend the demonstration? No. Well, Ellie just wanted to shove it in my face. All I wanted was to never see the man again. Seems you may have gotten your wish. Esther Holt seems convincing, but who better to sabotage a motorcycle than the man who claims to have designed it himself? And if he didn't write that letter, then who did? Precisely. So, William, I've decided to buy a motorcycle. Julia, are you quite sure? Of course. Well, you'll have to be so careful. McAdam is terribly unforgiving. And if you were to fall, if one were to fall and hit one's head, people really should consider protecting themselves. Perhaps a helmet. William, one can injure one's head falling off a horse or a bicycle. Imagine wearing a helmet on a bicycle. Well. Oh, William, these motorcycles don't even go that fast. I mean, except for this one, of course. Yes. I still don't understand how this V-twin is capable of reaching 75 miles per hour. It's simple physics. The, the energy output is limited by the size of the engine. It's only 54 cubic inches. Perhaps that has something to do with the fuel? It's a gasoline engine. The fuel can only... Unless... Unless? Unless the fuel was adulterated. Julia, you are a genius! Oh, am, I, am I? Yes. Yes. Uh, first, I'll have to... Sir? This is hard as requesting you in the morgue straight away. It was quite a mess you left me with, Detective. Uh, yes, I apologize for the state of the corpse. It certainly kept things interesting. His clothing was the only thing keeping parts of him intact. What have you learned? Well, there's nothing to suggest cause of death other than blunt force trauma. Consistent with a fall from a great height. Indeed. Although evidence of any other trauma sustained before the fall could have been obliterated. The skin ruptured in several different places and many internal blood vessels burst upon impact. Making your job difficult, I would imagine. Beyond difficult. I, I attempted to gauge algor mortis, but just as a steak and kidney pie would cool faster were you to puncture the crust, a compromised body cools at a different rate than an intact one. Why are you trying to establish algor mortis? We know when he died. Well, that's the strange thing about Mr. Drummond here. As I worked on the body, I realized rigor never set in. Well, that is strange. There was no time for it to have come and gone between him going over the cliff and the time that he arrived here. Certainly not. And calcium levels in the muscles should not have been affected by blood loss. It shouldn't. I began to believe something was amiss. So I took a closer look and I found something quite interesting. Putrefaction. Two spots at less than six hours. My estimate is this man died between 8 and 12 hours earlier than we thought. So he was dead before he went off the cliff. So someone killed Drummond earlier and dropped his body at the bottom of the cliff? Yes, sir. Meaning whoever was riding that motorcycle was not Mr. Drummond. Then it was the killer? It seems likely, but the majority of our suspects were all there. They saw the Falcon being ridden out of the garage and eventually off the cliff. So the bike went over, but the killer didn't? He must have installed the latch on the accelerator so that the motorcycle's throttle would remain engaged and allow him to simply send it off. And no rider at all? And whoever it was did not want us to find that latch. So they killed Drummond, then set this up to make it look like it was an accident? Indeed. So the culprit could not have been any of the members of the motorcycle club. They were all there and accounted for. Precisely. Although whoever was riding that motorcycle could have conspired with one of them. What makes you think that? Well, sir, if Drummond was killed the night before, how could his wife have been unaware? 
Well, let's speak to the widow. Someone killed him hours before? That's right. And you would have known about it. No, I have no idea what you're talking about. He's your husband. You didn't see him that morning? No, he was in his workshop. Surely you saw him the night before. He spent all night in there, preparing for the demonstration. I swear it. He did it all the time, working through the night. I never questioned it. The night before his big test run, it never even occurred to me that Mrs. Drummond, you must admit that this story is difficult to believe. Story? What story? You're the one telling me something that's absolutely mad. You're lying. I'm not. You didn't even recognize your own husband on that motorcycle. I... I don't know. I thought it was him. I don't understand any of this. When did you last see your husband alive? I... Supper, I think. Yes, early that evening. After that, he went to his workshop and I didn't see him until the next morning. Or rather, I suppose I never saw him again. Whatever happened, I had nothing to do with it. You have to believe me. I don't believe a word she says. Sir, she was among the spectators just prior to the incident. She could not have been the rider on that motorcycle. She was in on it with someone else. Well, sir, there is one suspect who wasn't there, the former partner. Could be him. Henry. Uh, yes. Contact the lawyer who wrote those letters and demand he reveal who his client is. If it's Mr. Esterholt, then we know he was lying about his relationship with Mr. Drummond and likely lying about his whereabouts that morning as well. Sir, is that something you want to leave to the likes of Higgins? Leaning on a lawyer can be a delicate proposition. I'm sure he can handle it. Also, sir, I believe I know how the Falcon was able to reach 75 miles per hour, and I intend to replicate it. You see, the only limitation is the volume or displacement of an engine. I intend to make the... Murdoch! You've lost me already. William, here's your nitrous oxide. Good. Why on earth do you need laughing gas? It's quite fascinating, actually. I realized that the speed at which fuel gets consumed... I'm couldn't... sure it's fascinating, but I have to get back to the clinic. Don't have too much fun without me. I make no promises. No. Sir, I found out from the lawyer who his client is. I already is. know, Henry. It was Harley and Davidson. Oh. Why'd I have to do all that work, then? As I was examining the Falcon, I came across something very interesting. Along the fuel intake line, I found a maker's mark. H.D. Harley-Davidson. And what do you say? It's one of your parts. In fact, the Falcon is an amalgam of many of your parts. And you knew that. That's why you had your lawyer send all of those letters. The Drummond revolutionary motorcycle is nothing but a reconfigured Harley. It, it is not a Harley, it is a Harley Davidson. Oh, that's what the man meant. It should have been Davidson Harley, then people would be shortening it to Davidson. That's a mouthful. A Davy, then. Gentlemen, the point is, he was stealing from you, and you knew it. Yes, it's true. We saw a photograph of the thing in Popular Mechanics. We could hardly believe our eyes. He was using your parts to make a faster motorcycle. He was going to win all of your customers. Oh, supposedly. We still can't figure out how he did it. The engine is the same. There may have been a minor cosmetic adjustment, but inside, it's quite literally our V-twin. Even after getting a look at the thing, it makes no sense. I disagree. It is possible for the same engine to make more power by altering the fuel. To what? The engine runs on gasoline. Yes, but with an additive. 
the same engine can burn the same fuel faster. I, I suppose, in theory. Nitrous oxide. It forces more oxygen into the fuel. The result is a motorcycle that runs on highly oxygenated gas. I call it hog for short. Hog? <laughs> now that's a good name for a bike. A hog would run faster while using the same component parts. <laughs> yes, but the, the fuel would burn in the blink of an eye. Who is going to buy a motorcycle when its gas is gone in 60 seconds? Not to mention the noise. The Harley Davidson brand is synonymous with the silent gray fella. Now we want everyone's grandma riding Davy's detective. Oh, give it up, Artie. And anyway, all that fuel igniting at once, you'd be blown to kingdom come. We, yes. But at the time that the Falcon was sabotaged and Mr. Drummond was killed, all you knew was that he had taken your parts and was about to outdo you. That's motive for murder. We didn't. I checked with your hotel. You arrived in Toronto the day before I met you in Drummond's workshop. If you had traveled all this way to meet the man, why wait 24 hours before making your first visit? All right, we, we, we did go there the day before. Already. What? We didn't do anything wrong. Look, Drummond wasn't even there. Maybe he was. And maybe you're lying. Perhaps you met up with him, confronted him, argued, and one or both of you killed him. We didn't. We, we didn't come to confront him. We already had an arrangement. What kind of arrangement? To buy the device that was making his bike go so fast. He was going to sell it to you. Not him. His partner. Mr. Vanderwick. He said he was tired of the production delays and he wanted to recoup on his investments. We can show you the correspondence that proves it. He wanted to sell us the device, the designs, the whole shebang. If Harley and Davidson are to be believed, Drummond's partner was about to sell the business out from under him. This Vanderwick was in Buffalo when the murder happened. So he says. He's just at the hotel. Well, if he's lying about that, he could be the man on the motorcycle. He sent the thing over the edge and then flung Drummond over after it. Or perhaps he threw Drummond's body over the cliff ahead of time. Well, there he is, sir. Look who he's with. Dee Dee Drummond. They're in it together. You were having an affair. Your husband was obsessed with his motorcycle. He was ignoring his marriage. Yes, that part's true. The Falcon was a bust. It was built with another company's parts. And unless you sold whatever technology Mr. Drummond had already developed prior to going to market, you would have been sued out of existence. Yes, that's true as well. I had to do it. But when you told Drummond, he refused. Is that what happened the night he died? An argument that got out of hand? Dear God, no. I never told him. I swear. You got it all wrong. We were having an affair, obviously. But that impropriety is the reason for any mistruths we may have spoken. Mistruths? You lied. You killed him. No. You don't understand. We didn't kill him. You killed him and you covered it up. You got all of your friends together who knew about the Falcon. But what you were really doing was staging an accident in order to cover up the real cause of death. You dressed up like him, got on his motorcycle, and sent it sailing over the cliff. Where presumably Mr. Drummond's body had already been thrown. How could you do that to your own husband? I didn't. What you propose is simply not possible. Dee Dee was there when it happened. There's no question. So she couldn't have done it. She wasn't the one on the motorcycle. You were. It wasn't me either. I was in Buffalo until I heard the news. Why should we believe you? Believe me. I'm telling you. I still have the ticket. Surely I last. Mr. Vanderwick. Ah, here it is. See? Timed, dated, and punched. I checked with Union Station and the 1040 got in on time. Could he have posed as Drummond and gotten to Buffalo in time to get on that train? There's no express service on a Saturday morning, sir. Maybe he drove. To make up that distance without stopping, even if the roads were paved right through, would be impossible. What if he rode? 
horse isn't capable of reaching anywhere near that speed. I meant a bike, Murdoch, a motorcycle. They are not fast enough either. He would have to have been riding the Falcon, and it was in pieces at the bottom of a cliff by then. Well, those two are guilty of sin. Sir, it's just not possible. I'm sure of it. If those two weren't on the motorcycle, then someone else was. The only question is, who was in on it with them? A third conspirator? There is one suspect without an alibi. And we know he's lied to us. You have stated that you were home the morning that Mr. Drummond was found dead. Can anyone attest to this? Just myself. You also claim that Mr. Drummond telephoned you the night before his test run? I don't claim anything. He phoned, we spoke, and the story. What time was this? At late 10 o'clock, maybe. Unfortunately, Mr. Esterholt, we know this to be a lie. It is no such thing. Mr. Drummond was dead by 10 p.m. Says who? The coroner for the city of Toronto. Well, he's wrong, and you're wrong. The man telephoned me at 10 o'clock. Is it possible that someone was posing as Mr. Drummond? I've worked alongside Ellsworth Drummond for four years and knew him for even longer. Be that as it may, it is possible that... Some Imagine someone telephoned you pretending to be your inspector. How long could they keep that ruse up? Maybe five seconds? I spoke to old Ellie for a good 10 minutes. It was him. Mr. Esterholt, there is no point in continuing with this lie. It's not a damn lie. Oh, sir, I noticed something unusual. Not now, Henry. I suppose you figured it out on your own already. Honestly, why do I bother? Figured what out? It doesn't matter, sir. Henry. Well, I thought there was something not quite right about the ticket stub you gave me. Mr. Vanderwick's ticket. Yes, you see, this one is his. But I took the same train with Ruthie and Jordan a week ago, and look. Same ticket, different date. The holes, sir. They're different shapes. I suppose it's possible they changed their ticket-taking thing. Or it's possible he purchased the ticket in advance, punched it himself, and was never on that train. Did I? Did I just solve the case? No. It still doesn't explain how Mr. Esterholt spoke to Mr. Drummond after he was killed. Henry, have we released Mr. Vanderwick and Mrs. Drummond? Yes, sir, just a moment ago. Mr. Esterholt! We need to stop them. Sir, I need your help for just a moment. Mrs. Drummond! I just had a customer. Ellsworth? I thought you were dead. William, what's going on? This is Ellsworth Drummond. The dead man? What on earth? He faked his own death after killing his business partner. Go. William! Excuse me, gentlemen. Oh, hey! What in the blazes? Oh, ow, good lord, that's loud. I love it. Look at him go. He's a natural on a bike. My detective Murdoch is one easy rider.
Mr. and Mrs. Drummond, you are under arrest for the murder of Reginald Vanderwick. Yes. Vanderbrick wanted to sell to Harley and Davidson. You refused? Of course I did. Falcon's my life. And you couldn't bring it to market because you were using their designs. You would have been sued. And you couldn't sell the idea either because you'd never figured it out. It's true. There is no device. There's, uh, there's no special fuel. And if anyone had ever gotten their hands on the Falcon, they would have known straight away that it couldn't reach anywhere near 75 miles per hour. You're nothing but a fraud. How do you do it? How do you make it go so fast? I had a need for speed. Huh. You really did it. 75 miles per hour. Yes. But as you two rightly pointed out, such a device is hardly fit for the market. No, but perhaps we'll install these nitrous injectors on our own motorcycles. It certainly would make a race more fun. And, and that sound, how did you make it sound like that? This, oh, well, I had to remove the muffler for the nitrous to work. <laughs> I want Harley Davidson machines to sound exactly like that. Are you mad? I'm afraid I have to agree. No one's going to buy a motorcycle that sounds like that. What do you think? What's this? Well, I realize that leather is the most durable and effective material to prevent injury if one had an accident on the motorcycle. Oh, certainly is interesting. Interesting. Nice. It's... Nice, William. <laughs> I look positively devilish. Oh. I don't know about a devil. Angel, perhaps? <laughs> One of hell's angels? <laughs> Can't wait to enjoy it. I thought you were here to teach. Well, my classes won't take up that much time, and you'll be busy. Oh, yes. I can't wait to see the long-distance transmission lines from Niagara Falls installed. Mayor Hahn will even be there. Mm, we'll make sure to write down everything in detail so you can read it to Susanna as a bedtime story. Oh, do you think she... <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> Very funny. Oh. With Crabtree on his honeymoon, Murdoch on vacation, and what's gone, this place is as quiet as a church. I wish I was paid enough to afford a vacation. Hey, what was that? Nothing, sir. Right, I'm off. Higgins, you're in charge. And I never thought I'd hear myself say that. <laughs> women treating women offers great benefit, particularly in childbirth. However, it's important to know when to seek medical attention for the mother or the child. One possible scenario. Please. Oh, God. Please, help him. Put him on the table. Careful with his head. He's bleeding badly. You all right? Can you hear me? Can you tell me your name? What happened to him? I, I found her. gone. Posterior blunt force trauma. It's hit from behind. It's a deep laceration, likely caused by something heavy and very sharp. The edge of a rock, perhaps? Without a full post-mortem, I couldn't say for sure. And what do you have there? It's a letter addressed to Enoch Snyder. From an Otto Fanschmidt in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I'm guessing this is Enoch Snyder? You say he was brought in? Carried in by a young man who ran off before I could talk to him. That was Mervyn Friesen. He and his family come into Berlin every weekend. 
And what about Enoch Snyder? Do you know him? I've never seen him before. Do you know where we can find Mr. Friesen? The Friesen colony is just up the road. Colony? They're Mennonite. Excuse me, I wonder if you could... Excuse me? Could you tell me where I could find Pardon a murder freezer? Uh, quick question. Oh. Oh, hello. Hello. Oh, is that for me? Yeah. It's beautiful. Edna. Go back to your mother. Can I help you? We're looking for a Mervyn Friesen. He's my son. Who are you? I'm William Murdoch. This is my wife, Dr. Julia Ogden. Your son brought an injured man into the Berlin Clinic this morning. He ran off before I was able to ask him what happened. He was scared. He said it was the Snyder boy. How is he? I'm afraid he didn't make it. What in heaven? No. Can you help us? Come with me. Mr. Snyder's death does raise some suspicions. How well did you know him? Um, not well. We were the same age, but he belonged to the other colony. I only met him because he was thinking of joining us. There's another colony? Over the way. Why was he thinking of leaving his colony? Uncle Jebediah is an old order Mennonite. His rules are more stringent than those we live by. Your uncle heads the other colony? Yes. My brother. But that is a long story, and we are short of time. Enoch was a fine young man. Quiet, friendly. We found a letter on him from an Otto Fanschmidt in Pennsylvania. Does that name seem familiar to you? We still have family there, but I don't know an Otto. What did the letter say? I'm sorry, I know not of whom you speak. The last thing he said before he died was, I found her. Does that mean anything to you? No. Not at all. Where did you find Mr. Snyder? Uh, it was beside the road. I was driving her buggy into town, and I saw his hat on the ground. I stopped to retrieve it, and I found him lying just a few steps away. Can you show us where you found him? He was laying right over here. The ground is soft here. His injuries couldn't have been caused by a fall on this terrain. What's the matter? Mr. Snyder was struck in the back of the head, something hard, perhaps a rock, possibly with deliberate intent. Then it was an outsider. Mennonites do not commit murder, Mr. Murdoch. It is not in our nature. In some ways, this has been the best thing to happen to me. I wouldn't go that far. The food can't be up to much. I've been saved. What's that, Bobby? I'd like to be called Robert now. You've been saved? Saved from what? I've entered the Catholic Church. Absolutely not! It's one thing for my best detective to be a Catholic, but no Brackenreed is going to become a bloody papist! I'm not becoming a Catholic, Father. I am one. You believe he was murdered? By whom? We don't yet know. The answer may, however, lie in his colony. You will continue to run into walls of silence, worse there than here. We Mennonites are mistrustful of outsiders. You know people there, though, your brother? I don't know him anymore. There is a rift between us. I left there long ago because I wanted to marry a woman who was not from the community. Jebediah shunned me. It was like a death. We pass one another in Berlin like strangers. 
If he can treat his own brother like that, the two of you have little hope. That's what Enoch was running away from. There must be a way to gain his trust. A young man's life was cut short far too soon. Solving this crime may give his family some peace. Jebediah does take in borders. Mennonites, of course. Meaning what? Is everything all right up there? Hello, Ermgard and Cornelius Penner. Oh, I forgot to mention, no jewelry. Oh. Perfect. But except, except for, for the, the beard. beard. Yes. Upon arrival, say Birkin Falk sent you. Jebediah knows and trusts him. The colony is similar to ours, but with even fewer trappings of the modern world. Where do we start? Meet them where they are, Julia. Talk to the women there. They will know things the men never hear. Mind, the men will not communicate directly with a woman who is not their wife. Right. Yes. Well, shall we, Cornelius? Yes, Irma. Ermgard. Ermgard. Is this the Friesen home? Yes. We are Cornelius and Ermgard Penner. We are passing through on our way to do missionary work. We need a place to rest our head a few days yet. From where do you hail? Mannheim. You come all this way. We are travelers in need of hospitality. And why are you asking for me? Birkin Falk said there was no one more generous and charitable than Jebediah Friesen. Surely the Lord said on Birkin, well done, thou good and faithful servant. The Lord also said, you have been faithful over a little. I will make you ruler over many things. Martha set two places for our new friends. You will join us for lunch. I hope you don't mind that I need a hand in the kitchen. Of course. This one slows me down, and we're busy preparing for a funeral. Follow me. I'm sorry to hear of the funeral. As are we. Working on a farm is rough and sometimes dangerous work. Though we... Come from dust, and to dust we shall return. It is hard to lose someone so young. Yes. What was the young man's name? Did we say the funeral was for a man? Oh, a uh, hard, dangerous work on the farm was mentioned, I only assumed. Hmm. Of course. How old was he? Enoch was not yet 20 and about to start a life with our daughter. They were to be married. It is as if we've lost one of our own. I'm very sorry for your loss. <clears throat> More hands make for shorter work, Ermgard. I hope you can help prepare the FASPA for the funeral service. Oh, yes, I'd be happy to help with the FASPA. Where should I begin? Come, I'll get you an apron. There is a vacant farmhouse nearby where you can stay. Thank you. Marta will send your wife over with goat's milk, apple butter, and bread for tomorrow's breakfast. This is very generous in these trying times. The Lord does not give us more than we can bear. How much do I owe you for these lodgings? You will repay with the strength of your back and the sweat of your brow.
I know I should not say this, but I do love having all the women together, working shoulder to shoulder. You're right, Martin. You should hold your tongue. It's almost sinful to rejoice in funeral work. Sinful? No. Finding community in the company of women, where we can be ourselves, it's natural. You've been meeting for a while now, but your dough is hardly holding together. Haven't you made biscuits before? Oh. oh, oh, no. I mean, I'm so sorry. I'm so clumsy. Uh, should I find a tea towel? Oh, no, not that one. Uh, you know, Ermgard, let's get out of this hot kitchen for a spell. I see we don't have any Zwiebach for the fast bun. That will not do. Come, let us to the bakery. Uh, you'll take care of that, yes, Ruth? Is it my fault? Is what your fault? Anglican. United. Episcopalian. Oh. I'd even be fine with Lutheran, but Roman Catholic, Margaret. What does it matter? Truly, he has faith. If I didn't know better, I'd think the lad wanted to send me to an early grave. Uh. Oh, and he wants to be called Robert now. Did I mention that? Yes, dear, a few times. The faith, I don't mind. It's the mackerel snapper I can live without. Hello, Inspector Brackenreed? All right. Yes, thank you. <sighs> Speak of the devil. What's wrong? Bobby's parole hearing has been moved up to this week. This week? I didn't think he was getting a hearing for another year. Apparently, he's a model prisoner, and his good behavior hasn't escaped notice. Bobby's prayers have been answered. I suppose they have. Oh, Thomas! He's coming home. Our boy's coming home, and we're going to be a family again. <laughs> oh, uh, thank you. It's good to get the blood pumping, especially after such a long trip from Pennsylvania. Usually Enoch would do it. You were right, it was as if you were heaven sent. Must be difficult now without him. I imagine he was a big help here on the farm. Truthfully, he wasn't built for our neighbor. Oh? He was uh, a daydreamer. Mm. And frail, like his mother and father. God rest their souls. But, oh, what a sharp mind he had. It's a good match for my spirited Agnes. Very tragic to lose her betrothed, especially so close to the wedding. Mm. I'd like to offer her my condolences. She is not with us right now. She's visiting my cousin and his family in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Lancaster, you say? Yeah. Met a man from Lancaster once. Fanschmidt. Don't recall his given name. Well, he would be one of ours then. My mother was a Fanschmidt. Enoch didn't fit in with the other boys his age. But he liked to talk to the baker ever since the man arrived. The baker's new to the colony. He is indeed. Oh, good Lord. How queer. Seems he closed shop early today. Must have run out. Agnes is in Pennsylvania? He said she was visiting his cousin's family in Lancaster. Perhaps that's who sent the letter to Enoch. I know not of whom you speak. Do you think there's a connection? There has to be. When I was in the kitchen with Marta, she stopped me opening a cupboard. It seemed like she was hiding something. Jebediah only spoke well of the boy. He seemed... Genuinely sad that he was gone. She described him as solitary. 
Said he only talked to Agnes and was quite close to the baker, who's new to the colony. Well, we should speak with him. You think he's a suspect? I don't know what to think. I hardly understand these people at all, Julia. I may have overdone it yesterday. Oh, so you don't want to relocate him after all? Surely you jest. <laughs> I don't know. You seem to fit right in here. They don't even have electricity. It's bordering on criminal. Oh, good. They're open. Mm. Morning. Hello? Yes? We'd like to ask you some questions about Mr. Snyder. We understand you knew him. Indeed, I did. Well. Watts? What are you doing here? Just about to proof this sourdough, if you don't mind. Are you a Mennonite now? In a sense. I've not yet been baptized into their faith, but... These people have become my community, my family. They welcomed me when I was lost. Last we heard, you were in New York City. I had to leave. I wandered for a time and ended up back in Canada. I didn't want to return to Toronto and found myself doing odd jobs for farmers in this area. The Mennonites were always the kindest and most generous. I admired their peaceful lives, and so I befriended them. And moved here? Jebediah Friesen needed a man for physical labor. In exchange for the work, he gave me a place to stay. And you're their baker now. To bake bread is easy. The ingredients are simple. When I'm doing this work, the world is still. And you follow their rules and believe in their faith? I do. Oh, well, forgive our surprise, but the Llewellyn Watts I came to know would have problems with the Mennonite faith. So, look, this is a place that prizes simplicity, honesty, and hard work. And what about love? Julia. The world is full of cruelty and injustice. At least here I can see and believe in the goodness of people. Mm. Unfortunately, injustice is why we're here. I don't believe it. What happened to Enoch was an accident. The evidence suggests otherwise. These are peaceful people. No one here would harm anyone, let alone one of their own. Well, that may be true, but we have questions that remain unanswered. So you put on these clothes and taken false names? <sighs> Something happened to that boy, Watts. We have to uncover the truth. By lying to a community of good people? I'm sure they are good people, but someone knows something. Help us, Watts. You were close to him, weren't you? We struck up a friendship. How did that come about? Outsiders can sense other outsiders. So he didn't fit in here? You could say that. Not all of the rules of this place fit with his life. He was uneasy about his upcoming marriage. To Agnes Friesen. It was arranged by a matchmaker. He wasn't in love with her. Do you know Agnes? She was already visiting family when I arrived. How long ago was that? Four months. Maybe five. Watson, something is going on with Agnes Friesen. The family is hiding something. Friesens have been nothing but welcoming and hospitable to me since I arrived. When did you last see Enoch Snyder? The morning before he died. How did he seem? Well, he was arguing with a woman, Sadie Yotzi. Who's that? Some, not I, would describe her as the colony busybody. She's a kind woman. She couldn't have anything to do with a murder. But she might know something. Perhaps whatever they were arguing about has something to do with why he's dead. How would we find her? Presumably, she'll be preparing for the fast bow with the other women. 
If you don't mind, I have work to do. I'll keep your secret for now, but finish your business here and go. Oh, excuse me. So we don't have excuse me. You. Are you Mrs. Yutzi? I am. I was told to ask you where to put the plots. Were you? Well, the, the food is being brought downstairs, Steve. You're the one staying here with your husband, are you? Yes, we're staying with the Friesons. They've been so kind. Did you know Mr. Snyder well? Yes. Do you have any sense of what happened to him? No one does. Just saddened his last hours were spent in strife. Oh. He was having a row with Jebediah that morning. I tried to speak to him about it, but he was such a private boy. I mean, it was clear he was in distress. About what? Well, he wouldn't tell me. All I know is I heard Enoch saying, what have you done? Do you know what he was referring to? No, but if I was to guess, <clears throat> it must have had something to do with the wedding. To Jebediah's daughter? Of course. Oh, oh, yes, that's good. What have you done? That's what Mrs. Yutzi said. I hate to say it, but Jebediah has to be a suspect in this murder. Why? Because Enoch didn't want to marry his daughter? Or because Enoch discovered Jebediah did something to her. You can't think. She hasn't been seen in months. Enoch's dying words were, I found her. You think it could have been Agnes he met? Perhaps. And... Perhaps that's what got him killed. Well, if that's the case, we're missing a rather large piece of the puzzle. We need to search the Friesen home. There's something behind that cupboard door. The entire colony will be attending the funeral. Our absence would be noted. Could be our chance. We've learned that Enoch Snyder had a public disagreement with Jebediah just before his death. And what do you make of that? We believe it has something to do with his daughter. We're going to search Jebediah's home during the service for evidence. We need you to occupy him should he become aware that we have stepped away. Absolutely not. We need your help, Watts. I want no part of this. Don't you want to know what's happened to Enoch? Not like this. I'm not a detective anymore. You still know right from wrong. I do. And I know the people here are good people. I'm the last person to judge anyone's faith. But you said yourself you are tired of injustice. Someone here is lying. There is an injustice that is being covered up. You can't know that. Oh? Then why is Enoch Snyder dead? What are you saying? That Jebediah killed him? I don't know. No, you don't. And you don't know these people. Watts, no community is a monolith. I can see why you admire them, why you admire their faith. But someone is lying, and someone is hiding something. Don't you want to expose the truth? That's not who I am anymore. You're still the same person, Watts. You can't deny who you are. I've denied who I am every day of my life. It's no different here than anywhere else. Oh, you are hiding here, Watts. Hiding from the truth of who you are and the truth of what it is that you want. The only way out of darkness is to bring the truth to light. Funeral's about to start. Be prepared for anything that they throw at you. I am prepared, Father. And if you tell them what they want to hear, you'll be out of prison in no time. And we'll tell them the truth. Of course. The result rests in God's hands. And the result will be good if you tell them what they want to hear. I'm not going to lie anymore, Father. Who said anything about lying? I'm going to tell them about Gerard LaCroix. That it was an accident, like you said at trial. It wasn't an accident. What are you saying? We fought, as I've said before. But in that final moment, I wanted him dead. I meant to kill him. No, you didn't. My heart knows the truth. I've already confessed in the eyes of God. 
and I will not lie again. You do that, they'll never let you out of here. You might never get parole. And if I lie, I betray God's forgiveness. If staying here is God's will, so be it. You'll break your mother's heart. Is that what you want, Robert? This isn't about want, Father. Confession requires sacrifice. And sacrifice for her. She wants you home. She'll understand. I'm sorry. Someone doesn't want it being discovered. Julia? You're not staying for the rest of the service? I have a pressing matter to attend to. I'd like a moment of your time. This funeral has given me a newfound sense of clarity. Walk with me. Very grateful to be a part of this community and very much want to stay. We are lucky to have you. You're one of us. All that is left is for you to be baptized. What if I cannot ascribe to all tenets of the faith? What do you mean? Even if I'm ready to accept God, he may not be ready to accept me. You are a child of God made in his image. He loves and accepts you. And if I don't want to take a wife? Maybe not now, but perhaps later. I will speak with the matchmaker. I'm not interested in having a wife, Jebediah. You wish to be a bachelor? Yes. Life without a partner is hard. I know. Your relationship with God is your own. If you love him, he will guide you. And the people here? Will they love me if I live my life differently from how they live theirs? Have we not already accepted you, my son? This must be Agnes. There are over two dozen unopened letters from Enoch to Agnes here. They're all to Lancaster, but none with postage. Enoch must have been writing and writing to Agnes, and Jebediah never sent the letters. He must have sent the letter to Otto himself, hence the reply we found on him. I know not of whom you speak. That had to be referring to Agnes Friesen. So he confronts Jebediah with the letter from Otto, demanding to know where Agnes is, and is killed for it? Assuming all of that is true, where is Agnes? Well, if she's not where he says she is, one must think the worst. She's dead. And if she is, we may know where the body is. Just one more question. Good, Llewellyn. You're like a puppy dog nipping at my heels today. What is it? Where is Agnes? Why would you ask me that? Just tell me, please. William, hurry. I hear footsteps. I assure you, telling me to hurry will not hasten this process, Julia. Get away from that door. What are you doing? Searching for evidence. Is this about Enoch Snyder? He died in a tragic accident. No, he didn't, Mr. Friesen. He died from blunt force trauma to the head. You killed him when he discovered what you'd done to your daughter, Agnes. She's not in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, is she? What are you saying? Is she dead? Dead? How dare you come into my home? And who are you people? Open this door. I will take no orders from you. Now leave my home. Open the door. I said get out. Open the door, Jebediah. Please. Father? What's going on? As you can see, my daughter is alive and well.
That's pretty. Your hands are a little swollen. Are you experiencing any discomfort? No. Agnes, how long have you been locked in the attic? Locked in? We are keeping her there out of love, not punishment. How is hiding her away love? Our daughter was betrothed, but not wed. For her condition to be known would bring great shame upon all of us. So you lied to everyone? She may have been shunned. Our entire family would have been judged for failing to raise children who follow the word of God. So you hid her? We agreed that she would deliver the child and we would raise it as our own. And your wife, she isn't really with child then? Hmm. It was the best solution under the circumstances. You shunned your own brother for marrying outside of the faith 20 years ago. It hurt me deeply, but it was deemed appropriate by myself and the other elders at the time. But why kill Enoch? As God is my witness, I did not harm that boy. But you were seen arguing with him just shortly before his death. He had discovered that Agnes wasn't in Pennsylvania. Uh, he received a letter from my cousin Otto that put the truth to the lie. And confronted you with it? I told him she was in a good place and safe. It couldn't make him understand that I was helping her. If you didn't kill him, what happened? I do not know. You may not believe me, but God knows the truth. Get away from my daughter. Well, I was simply ensuring that she's healthy. I said, get away from her. He's still lying to us. Why do you say that? They know more about Enoch's demise than they're saying. Well, how can you be sure? I assure you, Enoch did not father Agnes's child. Meaning? Enoch and Agnes were already supposed to get married. What would have stopped the family from simply moving up the wedding date rather than this elaborate plan to hide her in the attic for nine months? Even if she had a different suitor, what does that change? If Enoch had no interest in marrying Agnes, why not allow her to marry whomever she pleased? It's someone the family finds highly undesirable. A union that would bring even more shame than a child out of wedlock. The ring. The what? We need to speak to Agnes. I'd rather not face Jebediah right now. Agnes, could you hold out your hands? What are you doing? When's the last time you left the house? She hasn't been out of the house for months. And then where did you get that ring? The grass is still fresh. I... Agnes, someone's been visiting you, haven't they? And your parents are out? Speak up, girl. Someone's been visiting me here. I'm sorry, Papa. Who? I can't say. You may feel it shameful, but I promise you, there'll be no judgment from us. Just time to tell them, dear. No, it's enough for the lies. You cannot. Her suitor is Mervyn Friesen. Your brother's son? No. Yeah. The one you shunned and cast out. He can never know. No one can ever know. But I want to marry Mervyn. We have discussed this. Mervyn Friesen is the one that found Enoch Snyder. Yes, I lied to you. Of that, I'm guilty. But I did not kill Enoch Snyder. Tell us exactly what happened. I knew Agnes was being hidden by her parents. But I had to see her. When her family was at the meeting house, I sneak into the attic. Did Enoch know about this? No. But he didn't want to marry her anyway. What happened the day he died? I was leaving Agnes's place when I found him injured on Uncle Jebediah's property. That's why I lied. I couldn't tell you where I was when I saw him. <gasps> You panicked because you weren't supposed to be there? But he was hurt. I, I, I couldn't leave him. 
So I picked him up and I brought him to you. You lied. To these fine people. To your own father. I'm sorry, father. All right, take us to where you really found him. I found him lying just here. No rocks that he could have fallen onto. It's still most likely that a rock was used as the weapon. There's a place back here where rock pickers leave their findings. They dump them in the creek. Right down there. It's nothing but rocks. Julia. Yes, that's definitely blood. There's something else here. Something left by the killer. Possibly, but Mennonites don't wear jewelry. Except for watches. Actually, I feel as if I've seen that somewhere before. I noticed your watch chain in this photograph earlier. It caught my eye because I didn't think Mennonites wore jewelry. Yes, it is mine. Walter, tell him you did not hurt the boy. I cannot. <laughs> Why did you do it? Enoch discovered the truth. He threatened to tell Abraham's colony that he'd found Agnes in her attic. No. He wanted out of the engagement. I told him it wasn't possible that it would ruin everything. Arthur. I saw him in the field, and I begged him not to tell. He called us false Mennonites in the eyes of God, and that we would be excommunicated as liars and hypocrites who shunned Abraham for a much lesser crime. What have you done? Lord, forgive me. I knew not what I was doing, but I had to stop him. Mrs. Friesen, you are guilty of murder. <laughs> Please forgive me, Jebediah. Please forgive me. It is not for me to forgive.
Prime Minister has picked our station to provide security. Because of the trust we've earned. No, only because your station is closest to where Taft will be disembarking. He's getting off at the Don station. By the bloody pig packers. Hmm. The Americans insisted on it. We believe it's intended to humiliate Laurier by meeting with him in the worst possible part of Toronto. Oi. So, I've drafted an itinerary, gentlemen. Please familiarize yourselves with it. You're leaving. Yes, the uh, problem is there isn't on Project Aardvark. Why Aardvark? Oh, national security. Huh? Not national security. The last one was Zebra, and we're... Oh, well, we're back to A. So. Thank you. Suspicious death at the telegraph office. The one on the corner? Hmm. The alphabet. Very clever. I like that. What have we, Henry? John Doe, sir. Collapsed while he was talking on the telephone here. And what makes this death suspicious? Apparently, the window shattered at the very moment he collapsed. More curious than suspicious, I suppose. <clears throat> I was here when it happened. I, I figured he had been shot. Mrs. Hart? No sign of any external wound, but bleeding from the nose and the ears. Thank you. What else could cause that? A severe blow to the head, but there's no indication of such. Hmm. Well, that is curious. I've looked everywhere, sir. No bricks, no rocks. Henry, windows don't simply shatter themselves. If something was thrown, sir, it's gone now. Henry, at what time did this man collapse? 10.15, sir. I'd like you to stay a little while until you're feeling better. Over Just there. take a seat. Have a seat. <sighs> Another one's just come in. This is Dunnigan. Mm. Dizziness as well as headache and what she calls tummy flutter. How many is this now? Five. Well, it's six if you include the woman who saw angels hovering over her. Very odd. Nurse Sullivan is calling it East End Syndrome. East End? That's where most of them live. Except for Mrs. Follows, who lives near church. Perhaps this is environmental. A localized toxin. How many is still here? Just Mrs. Dunnigan and Mrs. O'Connor. Find out exactly where they were before and during their symptoms. Contact the others as well. I want to track this down. All right. Bleeding out his nose and ears. Yes, sir. Presumably caused by severe trauma. Yet he wasn't assaulted at the telegraph office. Maybe before. The witnesses also stated that the back window smashed at the very moment he collapsed. Coincidence? I thought so as well, but then I found this in his pocket. 10.15, number 8. The precise time and place of his death. Mm. I've never seen anything like it. His intestines have ruptured and his lungs have collapsed. But he had no visible injuries. Not just that. He wouldn't have been able to walk into the telegraph office in such a condition. He could have neither stood nor breathed. Yet he was alive and well moments before he collapsed. Somehow this happened to him there. I have no idea how. Mrs. Darby lives across the river on Monroe Street. She left her house at half past nine to go to her job at the House of Providence. And who's left? Uh, Mrs. Ball. Which one was she? Unsettling thoughts and stomach discomfort. Yes, she thought she had a ghost inside her. Where did she go? Uh, she lives at the corner of Parliament and Sydenham and was going to visit her friend at Toronto General Hospital, but she went to buy flowers on Queen Street at Hannigan's. That's where she started to feel funny. Well, and there it is. All of these people start and end their trips at different places, but they all pass through this intersection right here. Henry? Uh, thank you. 
Have you been able to interview everyone? All those I can track down, sir. Right. Well, let's begin with all of those who observed Harjondo prior to his collapse. That would be... William! What are you doing here? Julia, what are you doing here? I, I thought this was a clinic day. Well, it is, but I've become somewhat of a detective myself this morning. Hmm? I've uncovered the most unusual syndrome, manifesting in symptoms both physical and psychological. Spiritual, actually. Spiritual? Yes, my patients report seeing ghosts and angels, and they all pass through this intersection at the same time. What time was this? Just after 10 o'clock, but it's hard to be specific. Did any of them happen to come through this telegraph office by chance? I don't think so. Why? Julia, a man died here at 10.15 this morning. He experienced severe internal trauma and, and what... Now you've... Henry, of the people you interviewed, did any of them experience... Uh, what are the symptoms? Headaches, uh, internal discomfort, and apparitions. What, like ghosts? Or angels. No angels, but I've got ghosts. Um... A Clement Bragg said he felt the ghost of our John Doe pass through him the moment he collapsed, but I think he'd been... Ah, uh, anyone else? Yes, Mrs. Jarvis said she wanted to help John Doe, but felt the hand of God holding her down. Oh, well, that's curious. Also, one of the switchboard operators said she saw an aardvark, but <laughs> she was obviously a loony. Please take us to her. It was nothing. I just had one of my episodes, is all. Episodes? They're not exactly fits. I don't fall down and start kicking about. You experience petite mal seizures. Just once in a while. I can feel them coming. I get crazy notions, but I don't act crazy. You say you saw an aardvark? Just before I blacked out. Flew off. Flew? It's some kind of bird, isn't it? Thank you, Miss Clark. How fascinating. I suspect her seizure was triggered by the same event that affected my patients and your John Doe. She doesn't know what an aardvark looks like. I'm not entirely sure myself. Then how could she have seen one? Well, certain types of epilepsy can cause hallucinations, visions. Do you think it's possible that she overheard someone say the word aardvark? It's possible. Why? Because it's the name of a secret government mission. What are the odds the word aardvark would come up twice in one day? Uh. Inspector, has Calvert Weston arrived? Who? The American attache. What's he look like? If he were here, you'd know it. Can I help you, sir? No. And he's here. Mr. Weston, welcome to Toronto. This is Inspector Brackenweed. You received my telegram? I did. We're ready to discuss your requests. They're not requests. They're requirements. Hmm. Which we are doing our utmost to fulfill. At bloody short notice, by the way. Perhaps it would be best if I were to clarify our position. This meeting is at the request of your Prime Minister and serves Canadian interests. Uh, President Taft agreed because he's already in the country for personal reasons and views this as a courtesy. That is understood. It has no official bearing and any undertaking will be devoid of effect. Now, as you know, this is the President's first visit outside the United States since Mexico and we do not want to repeat what happened there. Of course, security is our highest priority. To that end, I'm in charge of every person's conduct to me, and that includes you and the employees of the station. Now, hold on. I understood. This visit will be conducted with absolute secrecy. No press, no photographs. The president will have no physical contact with any other person save your prime minister. We will be afforded a single handshake upon arrival and departure. Any breach, and this visit will be aborted. Is there any of this that is not understood and accepted? It was understood. Understood, yeah. The President's train will arrive in one hour and 50 minutes. Let us proceed. <clears throat> we need to talk. Another time, Murdoch. It has to do with your aardvark project. You go on ahead. You want me to go with him? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Excuse me, Doctor. What do you know? 
A man is dead. Others have been sickened. Wasn't supposed to be lethal. Hmm. So, last fall, several employees at our Toronto headquarters started experiencing periods of acute discomfort, which subsided after a moment or two. We assumed it was the Belgians. The Belgians? Yes, their consulate is directly across the street. Then you don't trust them. Does anyone? Uh, you believe the Belgians created some kind of secret weapon? We did, but we were wrong. It turned out that these attacks were emanating from a sump pump that had become unbolted in the building's basement. And the vibrations traveled through the building? Exactly. Once the sump pump was reattached, the problem stopped, but it got us thinking. What if it could be a weapon? Of course it did. I mean, the potential for crowd control was obvious, but there were other applications as well. Such as uh, murder? This will go a lot faster if you let me do the talking, Murdoch. Hmm? We contracted a German scientist by the name of Klaus Meisner to design the device. Uh, what frequencies is he using? Uh, between 10 and 20 cycles per second, with 13 being the default. So below human hearing. Yeah. It was a fortunate coincidence that the frequency with the greatest effect also turned out to be undetectable. And what is the effect? Discomfort, nausea, headache mostly. Well, that would align with the experience of my patients. I tested it myself. It's unpleasant to be sure, but certainly not deadly. And yet a man is dead. In manners and circumstance, deeply connected to this project Aardvark. So, there's something else you should know. These devices have been stolen. We assume by Klaus Meisner. We also assume that he's responsible for this murder. Well, I wish you luck. I need to get back to the clinic. Oh, are you sure? My mystery solved. Sounds like yours is just beginning. <laughs> Shall we start with this John Doe? Yes. Oh. Do you know this man? Yes, I do. This is Klaus Meisner. Why did you think Klaus Meisner was behind this? He was kicking up a fuss. Suggested the program be canceled, the emitters destroyed. Why? Believe me, Murdoch, if I knew, I would tell you. Where did he work? I'll take you. We're on the top floor? Yes. The floor below is to be cleared and locked off. No one is staying there. I'll get my men on it. That would require me to trust their competence. Your men will patrol the periphery. Two on the roof, another two in each stairwell. Armed, of course. May get shotguns. Less chance of missing. You give me ten men and I'll pick six. We'll go with that chair. It's more sturdy. The president has a bad back. Now, where's the telephone? I'm expecting a call from the first lady. Who? The president's wife. Oh. The call will be coming at 5 o'clock. Tell the front desk to make sure that line is open. What time did Meisner die? 10.15? Why? Yeah. I was here at 11 looking for him. Left that in the door jam. Someone's been here. I may still be here. You! Step into view with your hands raised. Alexander Graham Bell. Detective Murdoch, what a surprise. I'm sorry, I don't believe we've met. Uh, Mr. Bell, this is Terence. He doesn't need to know my name. What are you doing here, Mr. Bell? I came at the request of Klaus Meisner. For what purpose? Well, he, he wanted to use an instrument I've built to measure subsonic vibrations. May I ask what all this is about? Uh, we believe a subsonic wave emitter built by Klaus Meisner was used to kill him. That's still speculation, Murdoch. Klaus is dead? My God. 
I, I spoke to him just this morning. He was supposed to meet me here at noon. <laughs> is this the emitter? It is. And unfortunately, the only one left in our possession. Gentlemen, would you like a demonstration? All right. Uh, stand no closer than 10 feet or you will experience the worst headache of your life. Uh. Ready? Yes. I must confess I had to retain strict control over certain muscles I only have excuse to use once a day. Common symptom. Some agents couldn't maintain any control. So, as you can see, effective crowd control, but even at this close range, the waves produced are not fatal. Yes, but Klaus Meisner is dead. What if several machines were aimed at him? Well, their waves would likely interfere with each other and cancel each other out. Ah, they were to converge at peak amplitude. Peak. What? Well, if the emitters were equidistant, huh, and fired synchronously, the wave peaks would converge at a single point. The resulting amplitude would be the sum of each. So, say, ten emitters, precisely arrayed, would produce an amplitude ten times greater at the point of convergence. Yes, but keep in mind that the intensity will diminish to the square root of the distance. Of course. Mm -hmm. Just how many machines are missing, Myers? 78. 78? Oh, I suppose that could kill a man. Is this it? One vehicle? It was our understanding only the president and his driver would be leaving from the station. In full view with no protection. I want three cars, one in the front, one following. There will be no stopping between the station and the Dominion Hotel. These are Meisner's notes on the emitters. It seems he had the same idea as you, Mr. Bell. He'd even worked out the interference patterns. Well, I would have thought as much. He was serious about this. What are you two talking about? What the devil is an interference pattern? Well, when waves interact, they either amplify or destroy one another, creating nodes of high and low amplitude. Rather beautiful geometry. Hmm? Which would explain the effect on the people outside the telegraph office when Mr. Meisner collapsed. Hmm. They each occupied a different node. Huh. That makes sense. Oh. That's a film. That's Klaus Meisner. It appears he's conducting an experiment. Perhaps he's testing his theories. Who is that? Meisner's assistant, Rupert Lamar. Where is he now? We've yet to locate him. Good Lord. It can make you burst? I... I believe the wavelength emitted matched the resonant frequency of the watermelon. Much like the voice of a soprano could shatter a wine glass. So what would be the resonant frequency of the human body? Different organs and materials would have different natural frequencies, but I suspect, given what we've seen, that it would be in the subsonic range. Meisner was targeted. How? Having separate waveforms converge at a single point would require Absolute precision in both location and timing. So how could they possibly know he was going to position himself in exactly the right place? Very true. A few feet to the side and the effects would have been very different. He was at a specific place and time. He was on the telephone. Of course. Whoever triggered the devices was possibly on the phone with him at the time. How did he, did he call them? Or they called him. 
This note was found in Klaus Meisner's pocket, uh, the man who died earlier. That's right. Telephone number eight at 1015. Yes. Now, what I need to know is who was on the other end of that call, or at the very least, whether it was placed or received. I can do you better than that. The call came from FP412, from a man called Grant Taylor. How did you... Mr. Meisner was expecting a call in booth eight and wanted to know who was going to be calling, so I wrote it down. Huh. Mr. Taylor? How is it that a witness to Mr. Meisner's collapse at the very same time called him from a telephone three blocks away? I have nothing to say. Oh, come now, Mr. Taylor. It was your phone call that ensured his death. You could be facing the noose. I have nothing to say. Put him in the cells. So we know the waveforms converged at the telegraph office here. So you're saying the emitters are located along these concentric lines here? Mm -hmm. How far apart are these? 87 feet, which corresponds to 13 cycles per second. Let's start kicking down some doors. Something's happening, Aya. Oh, move, both of you. I believe we're under attack. It's not that severe. We must be inside one of the nodes, but we're not the intended target. The cells. I don't understand. If the emitters were set along these lines in order to converge at the telegraph office here, then how were they able to converge at our station house here a block away? Could they have relocated every emitter? No, that would be impossible with such short notice. Mm. And Mr. Taylor was only in our station house for what, 15 minutes? Perhaps our assumptions were wrong. Meisner's emitters can fire at a range of wavelengths, correct? Correct. And they are able to swivel on their bases in any direction. But in order to be effective, they have to have their peak amplitudes converge at a single point. So, if each emitter was made to face a specific target and emit a specific wavelength, then they could target anyone within range? They would have to recalibrate the, the emitters very quickly. They must be set up to communicate wirelessly or something. Rupert Lamar, Meisner's assistant, was an expert in wireless transmission. But it makes no sense. They were like father and son. Why would he kill his mentor? And how did they know Taylor was in our cells? Unless he triggered the device himself. Unless he was merely a dupe. And if so, whom? Detective, my recorder is sonically activated whenever a vibration exceeds a certain threshold. Is it possible you've recorded it, then? Gentlemen, we are in luck. We may be able to determine how the emitters are arrayed based on relative amplitude and frequency. Eureka. I'd best get to work. I found something interesting on Mr. Taylor's finger. A tattoo was obscured by his ring. We've seen that before. Indeed we have. Three weeks ago, we uncovered evidence of a group of rogue agents calling themselves the Soldiers of Columbia. They're led by a former agent. You know him as Alan Clegg. Clegg? It's impossible. Clegg is dead. We've seen proof. Is this the proof you've seen? The tattoo was identical to this. But surely Alan Clegg didn't survive rabies and a tumble over Niagara Falls. The soldiers of Columbia are more than one man. You may recall we found the same tattoo on the hand of Agent Morris. It is their symbol. In any case, they've made their intentions clear. They want America to invade and annex Canada. 
And what better provocation than the assassination of the American president on Canadian soil using a covert weapon developed by the Canadian Secret Service? We need to talk to Prime Minister Lernier. You're certain Taft is the target. All we know for certain is that the soldiers of Colombia are involved. This is the worst news at the worst possible time. Yes, sir. We will have to cancel. No, it's too late to cancel. They've already disembarked from the train. They'll be here in a matter of minutes. Well, then we will inform them upon arrival. Would that even help? Didn't you just tell me that these devices... Emitters. ...can target anyone, anywhere? Not exactly, sir. Each emitter has to be individually recalibrated for each new location. It takes time. Then as long as Taft keeps moving, he'll be safe. Sir... But you saw how they reacted to Mexico. Consider the repercussions for Canada if this plot is ever revealed. Remember, we need this trade agreement far more than the Americans do. President Taft is arriving. This meeting is for less than an hour, followed by cocktails. We'll keep him moving. Sir, he'll want to sit down. Then we'll change the seats. And at all times, I'll keep close to him. If he dies, I die too. And in the meantime, find those damned emitters. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, lads, remember what we talked about? No one gets near the president. I'll inform the inspector. I'll see if Mr. Bell's had any luck. Mm. Let me through. Sorry, sir. Oh, for Thomas? Woody Elevin's letting through. So, we have a problem. Mind the curb, sir. Hmm. Your back hurts, sir. My nose hurts worse. Well, there's a pork pack implant to the south. Well, how many hogs does it take to create a smell like that? Must be in the thousands, sir. Hmm, they're an industrious people, Weston, but lacking in presentation. Are we really going through this? Gloria doesn't want a repeat of what happened in Mexico. What did happen in Mexico? A man was found ten feet away from Taft and Diaz with a palm pistol. Ooh, that's no good. Very much a non-event. No attempt was made on his life, but... Of course, the Americans used it very much to their advantage. Any luck, Mr. Bell? Well, as you know, I intended to infer the source from the amplitude and frequencies. And? Impossible. In fact, might I say blooming impossible. I was ready to call it quits when I discovered this. It starts exactly three minutes before the attack. Each pulse separated by one second, and each a unique wavelength. The emitters are firing in sequence. I believe we're looking at the primary wave, and this is the secondary phase. Of course. They're arrayed in straight lines. By Jove, yes. Two lines arrayed at right angles to each other. Right. If this is the station house, uh, what's the longest wavelength? Uh, 13.2. Two wavelengths, 171 feet. So if we assume the direction of the telegraph office, 171 puts us at the intersection of Sumac and Queen Street. And the shortest is 100 feet. That's all this? We found out that the emitters are arrayed in two lines intersecting at this corner here. 100 feet puts us at the western edge of the Dominion Hotel. Or Taft and Laurie are meeting. Could the emitters be hidden in the hotel itself? Only the top two floors have been secured. The soldiers of Columbia could have rented every room in the bottom two. Please continue your calculations, Mr. Bell. Henry, come with us. You check the basement, I'll start in on the first floor. Murdoch? I'll be right
Sit down. Alan Clegg. Well. Hello, detective. I must confess I'm delighted to see you, detective. Oh? Why is that? Because as long as you're here, you're not out there. You see, you no longer present the threat of discovery. You should be happy as well, because you now have a front row seat to a defining moment in history. And what defines this moment? Your failure? Your arrests? Your execution? I had forgotten what a charming conversationalist you are, Detective. Yes, there will be an execution, President Taft, of course, but uh, you as well. It's an unfortunate necessity, I'm afraid. But I would like you to know, Detective, that I harbor no ill will towards you personally. We know about your secret weapon. We also know its limitations. You can aim at a specific point, but not a moving target. Well, President Taft is rather a rotund fellow. How is it exactly that you intend on keeping him moving for a full hour? We don't have to. Each time he moves, you have to adjust every one of your emitters. That's 78 separate measurements, 78 separate calculations, and 78 commands. It's one measurement, repeated 78 times. Their rate in straight lines equidistant, the same function applies to all. It only takes a few minutes to reset every emitter. Yes, we recorded your test transmissions. I know the exact wavelengths of each of your emitters. You don't know which direction. You don't know which wave. I was able to find you. And yet here you are, all alone. Who else in that little station house of yours could possibly figure it out? We have none other than Alexander Graham Bell doing the calculations as we speak. Go down, stay down. If anyone shows up, slit their throats. Mr. President, I'm sure you'll be more comfortable in the capacious wing back. It's made right here in Toronto. Are you here to sell me a chair? I'm here to sell you on everything Canada has to offer. It's changed his chair. Why? That one's got more support. I've got a bad back myself. Age. I don't like surprises. Next time, tell me. Ah! Did you find the emitters? No. They're not at the hotel. Nor are they at the brewery next door. We even checked the barrels. How odd. According to my calculations, they are in the immediate vicinity of that corner. Where's Detective Murdoch? What's your stake in this? You must know what these soldiers of Columbia want. I support their aims. You're Canadian. Canada is a pasty child, beholden to an indifferent mother who demands obeisance but gives nothing in return. I'd rather be American. So much so you'd be willing to kill for it? People die in war. It's the price of freedom. It's not like I know any of them personally. You knew Klaus Meisner? Klaus is dead. He's your first victim. He was to be left alone. He was on to our plan. It was necessary. We had an agreement. And I changed that agreement. I've had enough of this. Sit down! 
Be a man, swallow your grief, and do your job. Are the emitters ready? They need to be recalibrated. Why? The temperature has risen. It affects the density of air, which affects the wavelength. Then you best get at it. Because come five o'clock, either Taft dies or you do. Help me put a stop to this. If we fail, he'll shoot me. If we succeed, I'll be arrested for murder. So either way, my destiny is predetermined. When did you last see him? Yeah, at the front of the hotel. They didn't come in, as far as I know. Well, according to my calculations, the emitters are arrayed along the perimeter of the hotel. They're not there. We checked. Could they be buried underground? Not buried. In the sewers. Another attack. No, it's the pre-attack calibrations. That means another attack will begin in exactly three minutes. Mr. President, I want to thank you for your generous attention to our concerns. Are you asking me to move again? I don't want to presume to take more of your precious time than is necessary. You'll want to be on your way, I'm sure. Mm, nonsense. My wife is due to call here at 5 o'clock. That has been arranged. It has, then I shall continue to rest my aching back. Look at the time that you two try to disable the emitter. Right. Are the emitters ready? Just finishing now. Good. I'll make the call myself. Oh, I wish I could see the look on his face when he hears my voice instead of his wife's. What do we do? Huh? We turn as many of the mitzvahs as we can in 60 seconds. Hello, operator. Connect me to the Dominion Hotel. Suite 401. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes? It's time. Oh, yes, we were expecting your call. Mr. President. First lady calling? Right on time. the president's life sincere uh, apologies uh, sir he saw i had a gun and didn't know it was canadian secret service I've never seen this man before in my life my back did he end you sir oh, quite the opposite i believe he's cured it
just saved your life. And that of the American president. I'm very much aware of that. Facts that I will make clear to the Crown Attorney. But you can't possibly think that you're going to walk away from this. I wonder what happened with my wife's telephone call. I assume we misconnected, sir. We'll try again when you arrive in Kingston. Oh, well, she retires at 9 p.m., and that's less than four hours. My back thanks you, Prime Minister. I will consider your proposals. I'll await your reply. Hmm. Well, Mr. Weston, please stay behind. I don't have time. I'm afraid you'll have to let them leave without you. What are you doing, Murdoch? He was working with Clegg. I heard the other side of that phone call. It was your voice, wasn't it? Dr. Ogden, detective? This is hard to forgive the intrusion. When I heard the news, I wanted to see for myself. We've had something of a history with Agent Clegg here. He injected me with rabies. Well, he's certainly history now. It appears the Y section has already been done. Mm, it just looks that way. Now we get to do it for real. Let me know what you think. Well, thank you. And whose idea was it to make a film? Mine. I wrote the scenario. Oh. Although it's not really writing. Hello, Alma. I told you. It's Lee. That's the actress who plays the killer, Lee Iverson. She takes her role very seriously. Well, why is a man playing the other clown? They were sisters. Yes, but there's only one killer in the movie version. Jack over there plays the part when the mask is on. Well, the audience noticed it was a different person. No, oh, Julia. The people who watch these things aren't exactly the best and brightest. Oh. Louise, a thought. In this scene, after the clown has killed young Miss Robbins, I want to take on the perspective of her paramour, watching on from the corridor. The murder is done. The clown is fled, but we hold as Perry watches in terror. And we hold? <sighs> Marvelous. Forgive me, uh, why would you film a, a scene where one woman murders another woman from the perspective of a man who's merely observing? And who are you exactly? Claude, this is Dr. Julia Opton. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is a woman dead, and yes, there is a woman who killed her, but the scene hinges on the inaction of this inert man, neutered by fear and cowardice. But the man is the most interesting part. I is he? Claude, about the scene where I fight the clown, how scared should I be? Scared? Louise, were you scared? When you fought off the killer and brought her to the police? I wouldn't say scared. Bravery personified. Mm. This, dear Francis, is the task before you. To embody this vision. A force of beauty. If you excuse us, Louise, we must prepare for the scene. Francis. Well, you have certainly smitten with you. We're courting. Oh, how wonderful. <laughs> I'm so happy for you. But did he mention that it's your character who fights and detains the killer clown? Yes. Well, that, that was me. I saved that young woman's life, not to mention my own. Of course. But there's only room for one heroine. Hmm. Quiet, everyone. Oh. It is time. We are prepared. We are ready. Quiet, please. Exciting, isn't it? Roll the camera. Camera is rolling. Slate in. Slate out. Cue the lights. And begin. You hear the telephone. Rise and cross. Good. Good. And answer. Hello? 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 But no one is there. It's just music. How odd. Replace the receiver and the doorbell. Oh, my. 
Whoever could that be? Now go to the door. Confused. Good. Pause. And now open the door. And... Oh, no! It's a clown! You're scared! Now he's inside and you're terrified! Where's Perry? Call for him! Perry? Perry, where are you? And the knife? Good, good. And pants on her? She is scared. And attack! Yes? Yes? And again? This is and awfully now, real. Retreat! And we hold! No. No, no, something is wrong. Julia! Miss? Miss, are you all right? Miss! Miss! Uh. It's real. The blood is... is real. She's dead! What God's name? Constables are searching everywhere for a man in a clown costume. Jack Richards, no sign as yet. It was so awful, William. We just sat there and watched as he killed this poor girl. Miss Cherry, did you know the killer, Jack Richards? I met him briefly. Claude knew him. Detective, this is Claude Cordier, the director. Did you know Mr. Richards well? We've worked together many times. Had he ever displayed any unusual behavior? Nothing like this. What was his relationship like with the deceased? Well, as far as I know, they'd only just met. Can you think of any reason why he would want to kill her? Certainly not. Thank you, Mr. Cordier. Oh, and uh, I'll be needing this film. What's all this bloody nonsense, McNabb? Halloween gets worse every year. Oh, I like the owl, though. On the Wednesday. Ah. Oh, bloody hell. <sighs> Sorry, sir. <laughs> Where'd you get that? Scared the life out of me. Well, they sell them all over town. Half the city's dressing as a clown this year, sir. Because of the clown killing all those people last year. How charming. It's funny. It's not funny, Henry. The clown killings have resumed. The killer, Jack Richards, is an actor who was playing the killer clown. Wasn't the clown a pair of sisters? Movie magic, or so I'm told. Does this new killer know them? There seems to be no direct connection aside from the film and the story. Heather and Lee Iverson have been sentenced and are in prison awaiting their hangings. A copycat, then? No sign of him? Constables have his photograph and are searching the streets as we speak. In the meantime, I have evidence of the killing itself. Hello. Don't you have your own tailor? No, oh, I was going to surprise Julia with a Halloween costume this year, but it seems I'll be working. There we are. Hmm. What is it? This shoe. Something on it? Dirt? Mud? Blood? I'm responsible for every piece of every costume. I would never have allowed him in front of the camera with dirty shoes. Huh. When was the last time you saw him uh, prior to the scene? A few minutes before. There was nothing on his shoe. Where might Mr. Richards have gone while he waited for the scene to begin? There's a small dressing room down the hall there. Oh. Thank you, Miss Canmore. Henry. Have you found anything? No sign of anything that could have mustered the shoes, sir. All right, come with me. Sir, I hesitate to state the obvious, but this man murdered someone. Does it really matter how his shoes got dirty? You could be right, Henry. Maybe nothing. Henry, th this is Jack Richards. 
He was hit on the head, likely hard enough to knock him out. And what about the other blood? Uh, stabbed multiple times. So presumably the killer knocked him out, stole his costume, then stabbed him. This is looking more and more like the killings from last year. I hate to admit it, but they'll likely kill again. Five bedrooms, three bathrooms, two parlors, two telephones, and a swimming pool. Ah, oh, it's marvelous. It's rather grand for one person, isn't it? Claude and I will soon marry. Oh? There's no telling how many additions to the family will follow. It's hard to imagine Louise Cherry as a family woman. I would have said the same thing about Julia Ogden not too long ago. Oh, oh. beg your pardon. Hello? Hello, is someone there? Is this some sort of joke? What? Just that. Hello? Hello? What was it? What was that? I don't know. A voice? Low? What did they say? He said, fire cleans the sins. Do you think it could have been the killer? I need to check the doors. Lucy, <gasps> oh. Lucy. Lucy. What's the matter? I, I thought it was we just had a call. We think it could have been the killer. Fire cleans the sins. And that's all he said? Yes. He spoke slowly. His voice was distorted. Distorted how? Strange, deep, eerie. I've never heard anything quite like it. And there was no music box like last year? No, just the voice. And you have no idea who might have done this? I wrote the book on this case, Detective. There are countless readers who might want to torment me. The knife used on both bodies is the same. At least eight inches in length, two inches at its widest point. Matching the knife that was found by the actress's body. It's a common size, but it does happen to be identical to the size of the weapon used in last year's murders. Of course. Thank you, Mrs. Hart. It's a copycat then, like I said. But the telephone call to Miss Cherry was lacking any of the hallmarks from last year's calls. No music box. And instead, fire cleans the sins, followed by what Miss Cherry describes as terrible moaning. We've got two dead actors and a threat to the right of Miss Cherry. It must have something to do with the moving picture. Every person that was on that film set is a suspect. And I have constables guarding each of the cast members. Save for one who's unaccounted for, a Jesse Fraser playing one of the teener victims. He could be a risk. Or could be the killer. Sirs, I checked the finger marks on the murder weapon against those of the suspects in last year's killings. We have a match. Who? That's the thing, sir. It isn't one of the suspects, per se. It's one of the killers. What? How is that possible? I don't know, sir. But the finger marks belong to Lee Iverson. The murders happened on the set of a film based on Louise Cherry's book. They're making a movie about us? Yes. Oh, my. Did you hear that, Heather? The killer used the same murder weapon that you used last year. In fact, your finger marks were on it. Were they? Do you have any idea how that came to be? I'm locked up, detective. They refuse to hang us, you know. They say we're too mad. I'm aware that you aren't the killer, Miss Iverson. But did you perhaps give the knife to someone prior to your incarceration? We had many knives. And what about you, Miss Iverson? Why should we tell you anything? I'd prefer if your sister answered. She can't. Why not? Custodian left some cleaning solution. She tried to kill herself again. 
The acid only burned away at her throat. I'm sorry? Please answer the question. I remember the knife. I know where it is. Before I tell you, I want you to do something for us. What? We'd like to see the movie. That's not possible. It isn't finished yet. Someone was murdered during the filming. I, I can provide you with other scenes, if you like. What scene were they filming? When the murder happened? The reenactment of your first murder. Irene? Yes. We enjoyed that one. How was this girl killed? I can't disclose Detective. it. Detective. How can I trust you with what I know about the knife if you won't trust me with the details of the murder? She was stabbed during the filming of the scene. The killer wore a facsimile of your clown costume. How many times? I beg your pardon? How many times was she stabbed? Several. And everyone watched her die? Yes. I left the knife in my house. It was hidden in the pantry beside the stove. So this is the Iverson house? Mm -hmm. It's been boarded up since we found the parents' bodies inside. Apparently, no one's wanted to buy it. Small wonder. If the knife's already gone, what are we hoping to find? Perhaps whoever took it has left some evidence behind. There's no knife in the pantry, sir. We'll need to look for finger marks. Food. And this tea's warm. Someone's here. Hello. How kind of you to stop by and visit me at home. What is your name, miss? Lee Iverson. Uh... Lee Iverson is in an asylum. She's a murderer. I'm not in an asylum. I live with my sister in our parents' house. I see. And where is your sister now? <laughs> that house is empty. It's abandoned because the Iverson sisters don't live there anymore. No. You're playing the role of Lee Iverson in a movie. Your name is Alma Greenway. Yes. Then why are you pretending to be Lee Iverson? Because I want to be Lee Iverson. I want to feel everything that she feels so that I can become her on screen. Miss Greenway, how long have you been living in the Iverson house? A few weeks. Did you happen to find a knife in the pantry? What knife? A large kitchen knife. No. Well, someone has. And it's likely that someone used that knife to kill two people on the set of your film, acting as Lee Iverson. So you can see why you make a very compelling suspect. Do you know when we'll resume filming? Thank you, detective. I knew I could trust you. I'll see to it that the warden provides you with a film projector. Now, do either of you know a Miss Alma Greenway? Who? 
She's an actress. She was to play you in the film. You recognize her? What do you think? Miss Iverson, please. This woman has been living in your old home. She impersonates you. She seems to believe that she is you. You think she's the killer? That's what I'm trying to ascertain. You're smarter than that, detective. Look at her. She's a fake. That doesn't mean she isn't the murderer. Of course it does. In my experience, anyone can kill if the circumstances are right. This killer isn't just anyone. This killer looked into the dying eyes of a human being and stabbed her again and again until the light went out. You've only seen her photograph. How do you know what she's capable of? She writes to us. Her letters expose her nature. She's a rich little daddy's girl pretending that life is hard. What's this? The letters. From Miss Greenway. Amongst others, we have many. Iris. This holiday's too much bloody trouble. That's just a bit of fun, sir. What harm is there in dressing up and getting into a little mischief? Everybody's dressed as a clown. What? What? I don't have any bloody candy. What is it? Sir, look. Is that it? Yes, it is. Call the fire brigade, Higgins. Sir. Everyone get away. Now. Judging by the width of the pelvis, I believe he's a male. But the body is too badly burned to clean anything else at this stage. Do you think there's any chance of determining the cause of death? I'm not optimistic, but I will continue with the postmortem. Miss Greenway's in our cells. Does this mean she's not our killer? I suppose she could have killed whoever this is prior to our arresting her. I'll do my best to determine the time of death. Thank you, Mrs. Hart. It may be a late night. Fire cleans the sins. Miss Cherry's caller. Do you think he was talking about this? If he was, what was this man's sin? All right, that's enough. Come, come, Louise. We'll marry soon enough. And I am saving myself until that time has come to pass. <clears throat> Not cross with me, are you? On the contrary, this is precisely why I adore you so. You're not like the other woman I've courted. Should hope not. Not like one of your actresses. Indeed. I love you, Louise Cherry. Oh. Who am I? Now, if you excuse me, I'm going to freshen up. Hello? Who is this? Why are you calling me? You have to die. You all have to die. Hello? Claude? Claude, you were out of the room last time he called. If you have anything to do with this, I swear I will... Did you make that call? You didn't. Did you kill those people? Damn it, Claude, answer me!
are you? The clown charged at me. We fought. He was about to kill me, so I took the knife out of Claude to defend myself. That's when he backed off. Then he ran, and I called you. You pulled the knife out of Mr. Cordier? Yes. There was a telephone call prior to the clown appearing. Same as before. But this time he said, you have to die. You all have to die. He clearly has some unfinished business, which would suggest that he will call again. Perhaps we can use that to our advantage. Any calls to your home will be rerouted here. The inspector and I will listen in on separate receivers. All the switchboard operators have been apprised. Any incoming call asking for you, and they'll contact the forwarding operator to locate the caller. What do you need from me? When he calls, talk to him for as long as possible. The longer that you can keep him talking, the better chance we have of getting to him before he hangs up and runs off. Appeal to him. Ask him what he wants. Tell him what he wants to hear. But whatever you do, keep him on the line. I'm a journalist. I know how to get people to talk. Miss Cherry, we can suspend our endeavor if you are in need of sleep. I want this to be over. I'd sit by the telephone for days if it would help. Operator, we're on. Hello? Hello, who is this? Tell me what you want. I can help. I want you to die. Why? Why do you want me dead? What did I do? What was that? Nothing. Who's there? I knocked something over. No. Hello? Hello? The forwarding operator lost the caller. He was routed to another exchange. We were so close. I'm sorry, sir. I did not... I thought I told you to get rid of that bloody mask. It was an accident, sir. Oh, we're on again. Hello? I know who you're with. I'm not with anyone. Liar. You think you're so innocent. But you're not. You're right. So let me tell the truth for once. Let me tell your story. The world deserves to hear it. Yes, brilliant. Just tell me what you want. Tell me who you are. Excellent work, Miss Cherry. We have the address. No one. He ran off before we got here. He must have known we were coming. Whose house is this? We're looking into it. Crikey, look at all this stuff. Killer left plenty of evidence behind. Sir, this is a child's toy, and it's coupled to the telephone. Hello. This guy's in his voice. These papers and the articles are filled with information about last year's murders. Correspondence? Yes. From whom? Unsigned. But they all appear to be from the same person. They're collaborating with the killer, providing him with information, 
encouraging him. Encouraging him to kill. Oh, my. What's this? A piece of correspondence between you and the clown killer. <laughs> That's impossible. I didn't write that. It bears your signature, and the handwriting is a match. Someone must have copied it. In it, you explicitly request... I didn't write it. The author explicitly requests that the clown kill Claude Cordier. Why would I want Claude dead? The author says that Cordier was a sinner and that he had betrayed you. He would never. He was having an affair with Frances Turner, the young woman playing you in the film. Frances. She adored Claude, but he was finished with her ages ago. So you don't believe they were continuing to see one another? No. Therefore, you have no reason to doubt Mr. Cordier's loyalty to you. None. Then why were you so unaffected by his death? What do you mean? You saw the man killed before your own eyes. Y you pulled the knife out of his back. My emotions are my own. I reveal them only when I choose to do so. Miss Cherry, all of this correspondence appears to be from you petitioning the recipient to adopt the clown killer persona and continue with the murders. Why would I do that? You say so yourself. You needed another hit book. With you at the center, you were writing your own sequel. You believe her? Miss Cherry has proven time and again that she's willing to sacrifice her morals for her career. If she was behind it, why did the killer nearly murder her in her own home? It's also suspicious that the caller knew to flee before we arrived and conveniently left a mound of evidence specifically implicating her. Gentlemen? Oh, Mrs. Hart. Have you completed the postmortem on our burn victim? I have. The fire burned him so badly there was little left to learn, but his left arm fared better than his right. The top layer of skin was charred, but underneath I found scar tissue. What kind of scar? A, a neat slice on his left forearm. Left forearm, you say? That's correct. I'll need a photograph of that scar, Mrs. Hart. Oh, of course. The scars are the same. Meaning? This is a photograph that we took last year of Perry Balfour's arm. Irene Robbins' paramour. He was there when she was killed, but if you recalled, he was too scared to do anything and then inflicted this wound on his own arm. Irene Robbins was the clown's first victim last year. And the clown's first victim this year is the woman who played her in the film. So she's the connection. Someone's avenging her death. And anyone who exploited it, such as the writer of the book, the director of the film. Have Higgins look into her family and friends. One of them may be the killer. There is something else, sir. I've been reading the letters that the Iverson sisters received. Admittedly, most of them are from admirers who are smitten with them. But one is different. The writer vows revenge and wrote, you all must die. Just like the caller. Anonymous? Unfortunately, yes. But the Arbison sisters may have some idea of the author's identity. Right. I need to see to Miss Greenway. The actress? The same. Her father's a crown attorney. He wants his daughter out of the cells. And we've got no reason to hold her, given that she was locked up when Miss Cherry's beau was killed. She may not be the killer, but she could be in danger. I'll keep an eye on her. You recognize this letter? What does it say? It's from someone who accuses you of murdering their child. Unfortunately, it's anonymous. So you no longer believe the actress did it? No. The killings have continued. How would I know more than what you're seeing in front of you? And perhaps whoever wrote you this letter has written you others. I told you, detective. Lots of people write to us. Maybe. Whoever wrote it is a parent, or maybe they're just a lunatic. What's this? What's what? Guard! Oh. Guard! Nothing. Turn on the lights! Good God. What 
have you done? It's what she wanted. Sir? Sir, are you all right? Henry. Yes, what have you? Irene Robbins' family left Toronto after the murder. They moved to Hamilton. Have you been able to contact them? Uh, not directly, sir. They don't have a telephone in their home. But I was able to track down Mr. Robbins' employer. He worked a full shift today at Woodbridge Electric Company. Sir? Henry. Part of this contraption... Yes. It was made in that factory. But, sir, he was at work all day. Perhaps his employer was mistaken. Henry, go and find the inspector and alert him. I'll telephone the Hamilton police and have them go around to the Robbins' home. Yes, sir. The Robbins' file's on my desk. Miss Greenway, I'd feel much more comfortable escorting you to your home. This is my home. Your real home. I feel comfortable here. Thank you, Inspector. Now, when can I have my clothes back? Your clown costume is evidence. Constable Evans here will keep an eye on you to the morning. Ma'am. There's no one there. Bloody hell, she's gone. Evans? Yes, Robbins. R-O-B-B-I-N-S. That's right. Thank you, detective. No, sir. She's gone. Do you think she might be the killer, sir? There's no telling what's going on. It's only me, sir. Bloody hell, Higgins. Did you see me screamway? No, sir. This is what Irene would have wanted. Your daughter was murdered. And that isn't right. But would she want her father to become a murderer? <laughs> You're the costume lady. No. You're Irene Robbins' mother. That's right. And she would have wanted me to kill every last one of them. I don't regret a thing. I wanted everyone involved in Irene's death to pay. Starting with that coward who watched her die. Harry Balfour. You should have seen his face. He knew what he'd done. When the knife went in, he knew he deserved it. Why go after the others? They didn't murder your daughter. They sought money and fame. Paid for with Irene's blood. I had to stop them. And yet, you didn't pursue the killers themselves. It was Lee Iverson and her sister who killed your daughter. You were supposed to hang them. You failed her. That's why I came for you. I'm only tasked with arresting criminals and providing evidence to the Crown. They should be dead. Four bodies. All your fault, detective. I hope it was enough. I hope Irene can rest now. Revenge, plain and simple. There is one question that remains, sir. Why concoct evidence implicating Louise Cherry? She blamed Cherry as much as the rest of the victims. That's why she tried to kill her. Why do both? Sirs, bad news. We found another body. It's Jesse Fraser. The actor that we couldn't find was found stabbed in an alley a few blocks from the film set. When? How long has he been dead? A witness saw a clown run from the scene about an hour ago. Mrs. Robbins could have done it before we arrested her. Sir, she only confessed to four murders. 
The two actors, Perry Balfour and Mr. Cordier, Mr. Fraser would make five. Maybe she didn't kill this one. Or maybe she didn't kill one of the others. Then someone else is out there killing. Are you going to be all right, Louise? I don't know. I just can't believe that Claude is gone. It's truly awful. Never should have written that book. This house, everything it bought. It's blood money. You can't blame yourself. You're a victim of this madness. You've resumed filming already. We're about to. The show must go on, as they say. All new actors? Hardly had any choice there. Who's going to direct? Me. It's what Claude would have wanted. And you know how to do that? It's just telling people what to do. How hard can it be? Uh, oh, and tell William thank you. Oh, for what? He gave me an idea. I'm going to write the sequel. Wow. It might be difficult to recapture the success of the original. However, in light of us vanquishing Miss Turner together, I imagine there might be a character based on me. I think it will play better if I just kill her myself. Oh. What are we waiting on? Why aren't we rolling? William, I'm home. Oh, uh, um, stay right there. Whatever are you doing back there? Uh, it's a little Halloween surprise. Well, Halloween was weeks ago. I wanted to do something special, and we were both a little preoccupied. Well, hurry up, whatever it is. And where is Susanna? <laughs> oh, my. Thank you for coming. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> Ah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> food, call me Monty Luffy. I've been making all these shoes, so don't call me no pussy. I had to switch it up again, I'm creating, I'm goofy. And if you try to fuck it up, I won't end up so smoothy. Stretch it out, gungo food, call me Monty Luffy. I've been making all these shoes, so don't call me no pussy. I had to switch it up again, I'm creating, I'm goofy. Try to fuck it up, I won't end up so smoothly Stretch it out, come the fruit, call me monkey Luffy I've been making all these moves, so don't call me no pussy I had to switch it up again, I'm creative, I'm goofy And if you try to fuck it up, I won't end up so smoothly Don't make me go gear full, because I might start a riot Maybe even start a war, I might use my bare fist I don't even need a sword, I already got a source, man, you know So I finna roar, if you fuck with my crew, my anger is finna sore I'm called the fifth ever for a reason I'm as crazy as a boy. I'ma hit you with this one piece as I goof off and explore I might get myself in trouble, but I always get the score, yeah Stretch it out, gunga fruit, call me monkey Luffy I've been making all these moves, so don't call me no pussy I had to switch it up again, I'm creating, I'm goofy And if you try to fuck it up, I won't end up so smoothly Stretch it out, gunga fruit, call me monkey Luffy I've been making all these moves, so don't call me no pussy I had to switch it up again, I'm creating, I'm goofy And if you try to fuck it up, I won't end up so smoothly I was hitting from your book, I was on back to the bone Throwing my grandma's on trouble, I get in the zone You made me mad, boy, I had cockroach to near the stone So if you meet me in person, you better watch your tone Make up, be on call, one day we did it all alone There is no 
thousands of bucks, this might be sad but dumb And at the end of the day, this I will not die alone Because I am a father, I was sent for my own Pussy boy, get out my way You know what I'm racing, I love you, stick to my veins Well, I've been in this fool, I will send you out to space So you thought you was power, do you want a fucking taste? And I'm not a shit talker, but I'll put you in your place If you want the one two, I will send you out the way And I'm not in the jokes, so these kids will not be played Bitch, you think crazy, that's what I'm gonna say Call me Monkey Luffy I've been making all these moves And don't call me no pussy I had to switch it up again I'm creative, I'm goofy And if you try to fuck it up I won't end up so smoothly Stretch it out, bring the fruit Call me Monkey Luffy I've been making all these moves So don't call me no pussy